The Infinite Conversation. Maurice Blancott. 13. The End of the Hero. It is true, the myth of the hero is not easily erased. There is the space hero, the hero of the stadium, or the hero of comic books. And we are apt to praise some state leader by calling him the most illustrious of history's heroes. The hero is the ambiguous gift literature bestowed on us before becoming conscious of itself. Hence the fact that the hero, despite his simplicity, is divided between doing and saying. First, if he belongs to the earliest epochs, he does not belong to the most ancient times. What the Germans called as margin, a term we translate, poorly, by tale, conti, goes back to an age of the world without heroes and nearly without a face, no attention was paid at that time to names, and the premythical character, even if he has a name, is not separated from the matrial forces of plants, water, earth or that common nouns suffice to designate. The era depicted by the tale is exempt neither from perverse beings nor from violent deeds, but, as Lunger remarks, when we meet up with dwarfs, ogres, and witches, we do not meet either Siegfried or Heracles. Even the hunter who takes on the natural environment at the same time belongs to it, merely availing himself of a right that does not belong to him personally, but that he exercises in a zone of collective and magical safety, originally delimited and moreover protected by sacred compensatory acts. This is not the golden age. Rousseau nonetheless helps us understand why we may be spellbound upon entering the caves of prehistoric man, yet remain free of heroic exaltation. No hero ever lived in one. The appearance of the hero marks a change in man's relations with nature. There is Hercules, Achilles, and Roland, there is the Sid and Horace. This list nearly tells it all. In the age of the tale there continues to exist a malicious complicity with the earth or the sky that is not one of unity, but supposes a common horizon, we are almost never on the vertical plane but on the horizontal. And if man struggles against the beings of the various natural realms, he does so not by a clearly warlike action but by ruse, the shrewd exchange or magical transformation that permits him to take the truth and the knowledge of these adverse forces in hand. Hercules opposes the nature from out of which he monstrously emerges, though he does so through force, his exploits are nonetheless enterprises, one might even say labors, and this renders his situation equivocal. Hercules is not a hero of the sun, he is too strong, and this force is neither virile nor divine but natural it is nature forcefully separating from herself. There is something sad about Hercules, as though he represented a kind of betrayal, the division by which splendid nature announces her grandeur but, as mastered deprives us of that enchanted knowledge that allowed us to acquiesce to her monstrous appearances. Force domesticates force and becomes servile. It is curious that Chiron, the centaur, is the bearer of wisdom and Hercules, the man, the bearer of brutality. Indeed, Chiron is not a hero. The hero fights and conquers. Where does this conquering virility come from? From himself. But where does he himself come from? This is the beginning of the hero's difficulties. He has a name that is proper to him, one he has often even appropriated a surname, surnum, just as we speak of a superego, Samoy. He has a name, he is a name. But if he has a name, he has a genealogy. The ascendancy he exerts and owes to his deeds of valor is at the same time a sign of the ascendancy that he owes to his origin, which makes him come naturally from above. He will never free himself from this contradiction. The hero who owes nothing to anyone but himself is for this reason divinely but thereby always and forever a god, thus it is no longer his action that is glorious but his glorious essence that is affirmed and proven by his acts, consecrated and proclaimed in his name. The hero teaches us something in this. First, our invincible propensity to essentialize. The hero is solely action and action makes him heroic, but this heroic doing is nothing without being, being a linear essence satisfies us, reassures us, and promises us the future. For ignoble obscurity is frightening. Glory is suspect if it comes from the night. The heroic act must therefore be always already anterior to itself, just as the hero, the first man par excellence, must be a man come from afar, a hereditary marvel, recognized and transmitted. Achilles, hidden and disguised as a girl, is nonetheless already Achilles. He is so by his origin, which is divine, his waiting, for himself, is merely a waiting for his manifestation. Not unknown, but dissimulated. Suddenly this occultation ceases and there he is in broad daylight, entirely visible bearer of a clarity that not only triumphs over the night but has also in advance negated it, already made it the coming of day. Between origin and beginning, nonetheless, there are dark relations that precisely the hero helps us to grasp. The origin is not the beginning, between the two there is an interval, and even an uncertainty. The origin secures us against obscurity but is itself obscure, either because it dissimulates itself or because, in doing so, it retains in itself the part of inhumanity that genealogies endeavor to make historical. Even with a divine origin one must be born as a man, he is awaited, he waits for himself, 
and when he declares himself it is easy to say that he could not have failed to appear. Yet before he proved himself nothing had established him as a child from on high, on the contrary, he was but a bastard without sure parentage. his illegitimacy is even what prompts him to make himself known. He thus comes to possess an origin only at the moment when he bestows upon himself a beginning and, without lineage, without belonging, makes his appearance on the basis of a non-appearance that only hid the plenitude of being. One Achilles is the hero, but Agamemnon is the king of kings. This difference, this distance setting the hero apart, will forever continue to exist, obliging him to be unique in order not to be second. Nephew of the emperor, paladin and necessarily noble. The hero is close to power, and often stronger than power, but his strength is eccentric, it represents another center that could not, even should it claim to do so, unfold into a system without disappearing. He therefore incarnates in his radiance, that is, in the most direct manifestation, something that is nonetheless indirect, an oblique affirmation, an equivocacy from which the frankness of his exploits will not succeed in clearing him. Even if he does not lie, he is on the verge of falsehood, his essence deceptive. His simplicity, indeed the most simply that of a braggart showing off who is vitiated by a duplicity that gnaws at him, he is thus divided between origin and beginning, between being and doing, magic and strength, strength and sovereignty, glory and the throne, rank and blood. That is not all. One must add, between saying and doing. The hero is nothing if not glorious. The word exploit marks this relation with the outside, heroism knows nothing of conscience, as it knows nothing of the virtual and the latent. Glory is the shining forth of immediate action, it is light, it is radiance. The hero shows himself, this dazzling manifestation is that of a being's being, the transfiguration of origin into beginning, the transparency of the absolute in a decision or an action that is nonetheless particular and momentary. But this glorious disclosure that leaves nothing to disclose, the hero's soul is the most empty, and at the same time claims to be inexhaustible, is the privilege of his near namesake, the herald, he who announces and makes resumed. Heroism is revelation the marvelous brilliance of deed that joins essence and appearance. Heroism is the act's luminous sovereignty. Only the act is heroic, and the hero is nothing if he does not act to nothing outside the clarity of the act that illuminates and brings him to light. This is the first form of what will later be affirmed by the name praxis, with a complete reversal of meaning. Therefore, heroic authenticity if there is such a thing as should be determined as a verb, never a substantive. And yet the hero in the plenitude of his name is all that counts, all that is important. This means also that if there is heroism only through action, there are heroes only in and through speech. Song is his privileged abode. The hero is born when the singer comes forward in the great hall. He is told. He is not, he is merely sung. The hero, the active man par excellence, owes his existence solely to language. But it must immediately be noted that between the roving bard and the forceful man who is without power and without place there is both a complicity of fate and a similarity of function. We praise Roland rather than Charlemagne for both are marginal, or at least represent a presence that is at once frontal and lateral. The singer recognizes himself from a distance in the hero, and in this way thinks he is making himself recognized by proposing recognition of the hero. Not that the poem, in recounting the marvelous action, is content to celebrate it, in celebrating it the poem produces it, rehearses it in the strongest sense of the term and accords it the power of redundancy that comes from the name and unfolds in renown, the rumor of glory accompanying the name. The obscure hero does not exist. Pindar will say, honor is accorded solely to those for whom the gods make arise a fine discourse come to assist the dead measured speech and heroic lack of measure have this in common, both affront death. But speech is more profoundly engaged in the movement of dying because it alone succeeds in making of dying a second life, and enduring without duration. In this sense, and granting that the hero is master, the man who seems to possess speech as a power will be this master's master. But is the hero the master? This is the question Serge Dubrovsky's book poses and helps us to pose. Two, it is his thesis that Corneille's entire theatre amounts to a study, or better, a profound exploration of the project of mastery, of mastery as it was brought into the truth of philosophical discourse by the Hegelian schema. The only difference is that Corneille has no interest in the slave, being interested only in the master, what are the latter's relations with his equals? Don Diego gives the answer, die or kill. Death the risk of death given or received, lived in and gish, that is to say, in the movement by which the natural man changes nature dash this is indeed the truth of the master. But the master is not alone in confronting this truth. The self who has vanquished death, and has vanquished by death, encounters other selves that are in like manner victors. Will he have to enslave them but the man who has instantaneously acquired superiority by turning against nature through the ultimate act of violence will only make a deteriorated phantom, never a good slave here or must he annihilate them. Mutual extermination would be the just solution, but would bring as a consequence the ruin of the state, the failure of power, an absurd collapse. To avoid this, Cornelian tragedy seeks other outcomes that are political and historical, 
it is a matter of seeing whether, heroism having become an institution, the master can form a society with other masters and the sovereign self found a sovereign order of selves. If there are seemingly happy tragedies in which the master as hero and the master as monarch find an equilibrium and concord, thus promising a long future of security and brilliance, the oeuvre taken as a whole fails and says nothing other than its defeat, there is no salvation through heroism. The failure Cornet's oeuvre bears in itself as its proudly dissimulated knowledge, its secret defect, expresses the meaning of mastery in its relations with impossibility. The hero is not without a progressive role to play, at a certain moment, he represents the impatient decision to defy nature. The hero does not want to be natural, nor does he want nature to triumph in him, even if it does so in order to make him triumph. Out of my heart, nature is what Cleopatra superbly cries, and they all say it or keep it to themselves in their own way. The decidedly heroic act could not but be an antiphysical act, a crime, a denatured crime, a crisis by which man not only negates what opposes him but negates the natural part within himself or happy spontaneity, easy courage, good fortune without virtue. It is not a question simply of carrying off the act, then, but rather of carrying it off in such a way that nature is vanquished, this is the sublime act, doing not only the impossible, but willing what one has done, he is free, he is master, he wills all he does. Let us admit this definition. It makes of the hero an inaugural self, and of the heroic self a will mustered in an act that owes nothing to being. But where does this will that we still call free spring from, what is the origin of the infinite it bestows upon us in the face of a limited nature? If it is a gift, the sign and signature of our essence, then it still comes from nature, even if it is from a transcendent nature that we received this exceeding by which we rise above her. To be naturally free, naturally antinatural, how could the hero be content with such a parody? Out of my heart, nature. This ardent wish is pathetic but above all laughable, as Serge Dubrovsky remarks, for in the one who formulates it, nature is long gone, and Cleopatra, who kills her sons as others might kill flies, need make no effort. This monstrosity proves nothing, nor does the difficulty of the act or the hesitation in accomplishing it are an indecisive hero is a comic hero, as for this burst of energy by which the admirable act to an act against nature and above nature proposes itself and is immediately accomplished, where could it come from, if not still from nature? Sard, through his cries and ordeals, indicated much more lucidly than Corneille, but in the same vein, the contradiction that threatens every free will that sets itself against nature. He also recognized in which direction a response might be sought, it is that free will does not belong to being and, as a consequence, is not, unless it succeeds in coinciding with the transcendent power of negation. One is not free, one makes oneself free and does so only by refusing but one only refuses by an action an affirmation that is decidedly negative. Three born like everyone from nothing, and nonetheless wanting to make of this nullity the sign of an exceptional origin, born from nothing, but not an ignoble nothing or rather from an already illustrious and, as it were, ancient void, uniquely present, but of a presence so brilliant that its present light retrospectively sheds light on all his past as it illuminates the future, declaring himself in a trial wherein he must choose himself once and for all and absolutely by choosing between everything and nothing a death triumph through a forceful act that is a toss of the dice, but that offers itself also as supreme reason, therefore master of everything in this nothing that he assumes and produces in the brilliance of a decisive action the hero master has no intention of returning to nothing. On the contrary, he wants to affirm himself beyond himself through a unique glory that assures the mythical survival of his name. He wants, moreover, on the basis of a uniquely personal action in which nothingness has for an instant become being, to found an impersonal order capable of unfolding infinitely in time and in space the invincible cast of the master. But there are too many contradictions here, too much bad faith as well. The fact remains that these are precisely the contradictions that define the heroic project from the moment when, on the one hand, the hero is no longer content to represent extraordinary action but wants to rise up as the extraordinary agent of action, as an I in and by itself sublime, master of the universe without being master of myself, I alone rebel against that sovereign power, and when, on the other hand, the hero who thus seems to interiorize heroism and place himself outside the ordinary, not by what he does but by the manner in which he does it, intends to pass from heroism to mastery, realize himself in his Tory by becoming the master of action, and, through this action that has become partial, exteriorize and impersonalize this undertaking since in the end it is his Tory, and no longer the singular self, that becomes the pure hero. Corneille, that is to say Corneille's oeuvre, accomplishes itself as such in this uncertainty. Hence the uneasiness, in some sense healthy, it produces in us. For if it discloses all the consequences of this uncertainty, the work itself hides from it, plunges into it, and at times becomes entangled in it in a manner that might be called exemplary. Thus heroism appears, at times as the exercise of valor and the affirmation of prowess, at times as the will to establish an order that will endure, at times as a pure anachronism, fitted out with all the old ingredients exploits, 
glory, brilliance, and the brilliant speech that is challenge or boastful provocation, at times as pure moral exigency, voluntary ascesis, silent delving, infinite subjectivity, at still other times as the seeking of power, cunning empiricism, objective and political domination when it is no longer a matter of losing oneself, but of reigning even if, sadly, this can only occur by making a good marriage you and finally valorization and exaltation of the crime of the state. All crimes of state, committed for the throne, heaven pardons when it makes us mount thereon, and on the sacred dais where the emperor sits, the past turns just, the future all permits. This uncertainty, this equivocity, is perhaps especially revealed in the meaning that death acquires, or fails to acquire, in Cornelian tragedy. Don Diego's die or kill shows that death is sovereign, a dilemma that allows no way out, for it is not even an alternative, but a cruel or deceptive redundancy. It amounts to saying, die or die, die as ego, die as alter ego, kill the master in yourself or in the other in order that, through death, the master power, that is, death as mastery and the unique mastery of death, will be affirmed. This, in a sense, says everything. Death is the presence in the form of a shadow that from beginning to end takes up the entire stage, speaks when the hero speaks, and responds to him when he is silent. The tragedy of identity, of a mortal tautology, death is always suicide whether it be immediate or, preferably, the doing of an intermediary. Except that this identity is empty, and empty even of death itself. For one dies there without having died, dies without alteration or suffering in an act that eludes, effaces, or suppresses all the infinite passivity of mortal experience. Heroes have problems, certainly, but death is never one of them. The anguish involved in the Hegelian schema, the only instructive one, is for the hero necessarily absent, how could heroes ever be troubled? So it is not from death confronted as a risk that they as acquire mastery, they die always already masters of death and masters of themselves in this mortal game. They know how to die, and they expect no knowledge from death, if one knows how to die, one knows how to evade everything. The meaning of the death called heroic is its escape from death, its truth is its making of death a fine lie. Where are you leading him? A to death A to glory. This is the secret, the naive avowal. In dying the hero does not die, he is born, he becomes glorious, he accedes to presence and establishes himself in memory, a secular survival. Or else, through a refinement that is in fact quite superior to this vain martyrdom, he arranges it so that his final ostentation, even as he is vanquished, can be another vengeance, a triumphant defiance before my eyes she dies, but she dies with ease, and in dying displays with pomp her oath that seems less to die than to triumph over us. There is no death for the hero but only pomp and ceremony, a superb, a supreme declaration, repose in visibility. Nonetheless sir, and this is one of the most important traits of the Cornelian oeuvre that Dubrovsky brings forward it sometimes happens that death ceases to be pure brilliance in order to become impure horror, no longer glorious instantaneousness but monstrous approach. This occurs when the death of an instant is no longer enough to satisfy the master's desire for extremity, when he must have a death that lasts and will not end. Such is the project of the surprising hero Ein Marcel, who, not content with sending the virgin Theodore into prostitution, dreams of an interminable death for her, if my hatred at its pleasure could inspire the torturers it would know how to choose, and feed my pains with a hard and slow death, returning it to you at once cruel and drawn out, and amidst the torments hold out to you your fate, causing you each day to feel another death. The aged Corne here rises to the level of Sard semicolon 4 and even if it is still only a matter of the bliss of vengeance rather than negativity experienced as sovereignty, something essential is designated at this moment, death takes but an instant while dying is without end, just as it provokes in the being who dies not his promotion to being, not his exaltation in a permanent identity, but his dissolution or his infinite alteration in the form of suffering or sexual pleasure. This same Marcel thus literally decomposes in the pleasure of the death she gives and the suffering she inflicts, in making the beloved die in front of her lover, at times full of their last breath, at times feasting her eyes on their fatal distress, and measuring the her joy, she finds more charm in the pain of the lover than in the beloved's death. Here, finally, is a ray of truth. Death is not something clean, neat, and valorous, it is not the keen edge of death. The pure activity of a master act, it is passivity and obscurity, the infinite of a suffering given or received, abject affliction, extinction without brilliance. How will the hero accommodate himself to such a discovery? How can he survive it? He does not survive it, he collapses in it, disappears into it, and this is the end we get with the admirable Shuriners, where Corneal takes his departure from himself, departing from the myth. Admirable Shuriners, perhaps precisely for the fact that the admiration always aimed at and required by Corneal for acts that are no more than gestures here no longer finds employ. To die, yes, but wretchedly, in disarray and distress, to die an unsuitable word since it is a matter of dying without death, of this impotent death that is suffering. 
Eurydice, want a dark despair to waste me slowly and make me deeply taste its bitterness, I want without the untimely aid of death, to be always loving, suffering, dying. The ternary rhythm of the final line, destined to augment infinitely its duration, strangely enough provokes a slight nausea, as though a slackness, a sickening rocking motion had come into play. A very harmonious nausea, it is true. Let us also consider that if it is indeed a question of an infinite suffering, this suffering is always introduced by an, one twice affirmed that claims to prevail over the audacity of death or without death daring or as though weakness could only present itself under the mask of a power. We know how Shuranas, the glorious general, the conquering hero covered with trophies, will die, he is to be cut down in Sinis turf fashion on a street corner. Hardly had we gone out into the street when from an unknown hand a narrow sped, two others followed, and I saw that conqueror as though all three had lodged within his heart to fall dead in public in a stream of blood. This is no longer a death but a liquidation. Like a dog Kafka's hero will later say. There is no longer any ceremony, pomp, struggle, or burst of energy, not even the resource of a public that would make this end, even if infamous, memorable. This is a death that is neutral, solitary, anonymous any death at all, the death that does away with the name and undoes courage, the true death without truth, a fall into the silent void. As Serge Dubrovsky says very well, the arrow that assassinates Shuranas does not kill a man, it effaces a myth, this is the death of the hero even if, once again, Corne tries in advance to give this oblique end the value of an open defiance. Shuranas, to whom prudence is counselled, responds that he prefers a decisive death to one left to chance, slash slash the king seeks my death, be it now or later, then let it be a flagrant crime, not chance, may none ascribe it to the general law imposed by nature and decreed by fate. Alas, indeed very characteristic defense, to escape nature and the common lot in seeking a death that is intentional and, having been willed, even if by someone else, capable of receiving a final meaning, of still taking on a value, and thus capable of remaining human. A death that is still an act and therefore in some sense exemplary, or at least significant this is the last ardent wish of the last hero. And so if Eurydice fades away rather than dies, although the discretion of this death without tears can also be interpreted as a willfully sublime bearing wherein pain is transfigured, you cause his death and cannot even cry. I am not crying, Parmis, I am dying, the line that brings the tragedy to an end will not consecrate death but promise vengeance, stay, mighty gods, this pain that hastens to die. And in your crowding ills in which I am plunged, ah, do not let me die until I am avenged. Hence it must be concluded, dying does not bring action to its end, the will does not die. Neither does the hero, he simply outlives himself, survives himself, which is the worst ruin for what he claims to represent. In Corneille's work, as we have seen, the hero already undergoes a mutation because he wants to interiorize himself, the heroic seeking of a beautiful self that will become the sickly satisfaction of the beautiful soul, and yet he wants to make of heroism a movement of his Tory, to reach the inordinate, on the one hand, through the affirmation of an empty F that will consist in an arrogant delirium, and, on the other, through the advent of a new form of political domination. In both cases the hero has already lost himself. If the word heroism has a meaning, it lies entirely in a certain overvaluation of the act taken in itself, when the act, dazzling exploit, affirms itself in the instant and seems to be radiating light, this dazzling is glory or splendor, a glory that does not last and cannot become incarnate. Thus, as we have seen, the hero always seems more or less to exploit the heroic act, he substantializes it and makes his career out of it. In truth, heroism represents at a particular moment, and represents no more than, astonishment before the power to act, astonishment before what is no longer the magical power bestowed by nature, but the marvelous human that is given him personally in conquering action, what? That could be done. And let us note that the true hero is not always the man who acts. He is also the instrument of action, not only Achilles but his weapons, not Roland but Durandal. Perhaps we must conclude that there can be no tragic hero, and the only genre suitable to this sort of enterprise is epic rhapsody. The epic recounts an unparalleled action and untiringly reiterates it. The repetition of the unique does not impoverish admiration. The exploit must be renewed or, more exactly, begin anew, even if it is still the same story, novelty is useless. The exploit is exhausted in the instant, but since in this genre exhaustion, with all the misery this word entails, is forbidden, everything must start up again unceasingly and with an evenness of success that suffers no interruption. The epic has neither beginning nor end. And so it must be with the hero, appearing, disappearing, simple and gracious material support for a marvelous act that is inscribed in legend but not in history. His action is for nothing, and efficacy is not one of its qualities, it is a beautiful flash in the sky, not the crude furrow plowed in the earth. In this sense, as we see, the hero's action is very close to the aesthetic category that it will for a long while harbor, and even in the ambiguity that is proper to it. An action for nothing, but an action all the same, 
a feat of valor, but a victory that often corresponds to some real event one may remember. And this hero, appearing a without Bertha and disappearing a without death in the truth of his brilliant act, there is thus no room for sadness on the listener's part about an end that is not won. Does not content himself with this destiny that traverses time in a sterile burst, exactly as is effaced, scarcely said, the most beautiful speech. From this death without trace, a death neither wholly private nor truly historical, putting in question neither a dynasty nor the sovereignty of a state, the hero makes himself into a superior, quasi in temporal duration of the one given by victorious Mamoi, and on the basis of what is most discontinuous, a dazzling appearance, he achieves the surest continuity, finding again without difficulty in legend all that he lacked in history. Thus one could say that he represents the first form of what will later be meant, but in a sense still scarcely elucidated, when one speaks of an existence that is public, for he has no other presence than an exterior presence, and seems turned solely toward the outside, hence also corresponding to the speech that quite wholly produces him and that he in turn translates. Literature, heroism, each the other's accomplice and dupe, for centuries exchanging their gifts. The song bestows glory and guarantees the name by its renown while the singer himself is obscure and remains anonymous. Then the hero becomes his hero, the artist in his turn lays claim to immortality, not indirectly but directly, the work of art eternalizes, and itself becomes eternal in the manifestation of a quasi-presence, which, in history itself, believes it represents possibilities that are more than historical. At this moment candidate heroes can be seen as hesitating between writing and dominating, shining by the redundancy of a literary style of prestige and by the prestige of a personage that is by nature redundant. But as two certainties are better than one, heroes become their own herald, providing themselves with a legend by writing their story and wanting to make each of their words a feat, as they want to make each decision a gesture that is already oratorical. Finally and this is indeed curious it is the pride of speech, the concern with aesthetic staging that wins out. The hero becomes the adventurer, and the adventure the feat of a prudent and well articulated discourse. Thus the circle closes upon itself once again. In the meantime, it is true, literature has discreetly retired having at last discovered that where it is in play it cannot be a question of immortality, of power, or of glory. 14. The narrative voice, the he, the neutral. I write, I pronounce, this sentence, the forces of life suffice only up to a certain point. As I pronounce it, I think of something very simple, the experience of weariness that constantly makes us feel a limited life, you take a few steps on the street, eight or nine, then you fall. The limit set by weariness limits life. The meaning of life is in turn limited by this limit, a limited meaning of a limited life. But reversal occurs that can be discovered in various ways. Language modifies the situation. The sentence I pronounce tends to draw into the very inside of life the limit that was only supposed to mark it from the outside. Life is said to be limited. The limit does not disappear, but it takes from language the perhaps unlimited meaning that it claims to limit. The meaning of the limit, by affirming it, contradicts the limitation of meaning, or at least displaces it. But because of this, the knowledge of the limit understood as a limitation of meaning risks being lost. So how are we to speak of this limit, say its meaning, without allowing meaning to unlimit it? Here we must enter into another kind of language, and in the meantime realize that the sentence the forces of life is not, as such, entirely possible. Nevertheless, let us hold on to it. Let us write a narrative in which it has a place as an accomplishment of the narrative itself. What is the difference between these two identical sentences? The difference is certainly very great. I can represent it roughly as follows, the narrative would be like a circle neutralizing life, which does not mean without any relation to it, but that its relation to life would be a neutral one. Within this circle the meaning of what is and of what is said is indeed still given, but from out of a withdrawal, from a distance where all meaning and all lack of meaning are neutralized beforehand. A reserve that exceeds every meaning already signified, without being considered either a richness or a pure and simple privation. Like a speech that does not illuminate and does not obscure. Often in a bad narrative you assuming that there are bad narratives, which is not altogether certain we have the impression that someone is speaking in the background and prompting the characters, or even the events with what they are to say, an indiscreet and awkward intrusion. We say it is the author speaking, an authoritarian and complacent I still anchored in life who breaks in without restraint. This is indiscreet, also indiscreet, it is true here and this is how the circle is effaced. But it is also true that the impression that someone is talking in the background is really part of the singularity of narrative and the truth of the circle, as though the center of the circle lay outside the circle, behind it and infinitely far back, as though the outside were precisely this center that could only be the absence of any center. Now this outside, this in back, which is in no way a space of domination or a lofty space from which one might grasp everything in a single glance and command the events, of the circle, would this in back not be the very distance that language takes from its own lack as its limit? 
are distant certainly altogether exterior, but that inhabits language and in some sense constitutes it, an infinite distance such that to hold oneself within language is to be always already outside, and such that, if it were possible to entertain this distance, to relate it in the sense that is proper to it, then one would be able to speak of a limit, that is, bring to the point of speech an experience of limits and the limit experience. Now considered from this point of view, narrative would be the hazardous space where the sentence the forces of life can be affirmed in its truth, but where in turn all sentences, even the most innocent, risk assuming the same ambiguous status that language assumes at its limit. A limit that is perhaps the neutral. I will not hark back to the use of personal pronouns in the novel, which has given rise to so many remarkable studies. 11 think we must go further back. If, as has been shown, in the space of literature, to write is to pass from I to he, but if he, when substituted for I, does not simply designate another me any more than it would designate aesthetic disinterestedness that impure contemplative pleasure that allows the reader and the spectator to participate in the tragedy through distraction or what remains to be discovered is what is at stake when writ in response to the demands of this uncharacterizable he. We hear in the narrative form, and always as though it were extra, something indeterminate speaking, something the evolution of this form works round and isolates, until it gradually becomes manifest, although in a deceptive way. The he, or it, ill backslash is the UN lighted event that occurs when one tells a story. The distant epic narrator recounts exploits that happened and that he seems to be reproducing, whether or not he witnessed them. But the narrator is not a historian. His song is the expanse where, in the presence of a remembrance, there comes to speech the event that takes place there, memory, muse and mother of muses, holds truth within itself, that is to say, the reality of what takes place. It is in his song that Orpheus really descends to the underworld or which we translate by adding that he descends to it through the power of his singing. But this song, already instrumental, signifies an alteration in the institution of narration. To tell a story is a mysterious thing. The mysterious of the epic institution very quickly splits, the he becomes the impersonal coherency of a story, in the full and rather magical sense of this word. The story stands alone, preformed in the thought of a demiurge, and since it exists on its own there is nothing left to do but tell it but the story soon becomes disenchanted. The experience of the disenchanted world that Don Quixote introduced into literature is the experience that dissipates the story by contrasting it to the banality of the real, this is how realism seizes on the form of the novel that for a long time to come will be the most effective genre of the developing bourgeoisie. Here the he, ill backslashes everyday life without adventure. What happens when nothing is happening? The course of the world as it escapes notice, the passing of time, life routine and monotonous. At the same time and in a manner more visibly that he marks the intrusion of the character, the novelist is one who forgoes saying I, but delegates this power to others, the novel is peopled with little egos a tormented, ambitious, unhappy, although always satisfied in their unhappiness, the individual is affirmed in his subjective richness, his inner freedom, his psychology, the novel's narration, that of individuality, is already marked leaving aside the content itself by an ideology to the extent that it assumes that the individual, with his particular characteristics and his limits, suffices to express the world, it assumes, in other words, that the course of the world remains that of individual particularity. Thus we can see that the he has split in two, on the one hand, there is something to tell, the objective real such as it is immediately present to an interested gaze, on the other hand, this real is reduced to a constellation of individual lives, of subjectivity to a multiple and personalized he, an ego manifest under the cloak of a he that is apparent. In the interval of the narrative, the narrator's voice, sometimes fictive, sometimes without any mask, can be heard more or less accurately. What has given way in this remarkable construction? Almost everything. I will not dwell on it. There is something else that should be said. Let us draw a comparison, while remaining aware of the clumsiness of such an unduly simplistic procedure, between the impersonality of the novel as it is rightly or wrongly attributed to Flaubert, and the impersonality of a novel by Kafka. The impersonality of the impersonal novel is the impersonality of aesthetic distance. Its watchword is imperious, the novelist must not intervene. The author even if Madame Bovary is myself or does away with all direct relations between himself and the novel, reflection, commentary, and moralizing intrusion, still brilliantly authorized instant law Balzac, become mortal sins. Why? For two reasons that, although they nearly merge, are different. The first, what is recounted has aesthetic value to the extent that the interest one takes in it is an interest from a distance, disinterestedness an essential category in the judgment of taste since Kant and even Aristotle means that the aesthetic act, if it wishes to create a legitimate interest, ought to be based on no interest whatsoever. A disinterested interest. Thus the author must take and heroically keep his distance so the reader or the spectator can also remain at a distance. The ideal is still the form of representation of classical theatre, the narrator is there only to raise the curtain. The play is performed down on the stage, 
from time immemorial and as though without him, he does not tell, he shows, and the reader does not read, he looks, attending, taking part without participating. The other reason is nearly the same, although quite different, the author must not intervene because the novel is a work of art, and the work of art exists quite by itself, an unreal thing in the world outside the world, it must be left free, the props removed, the moorings cut, in order to maintain its status as an imaginary object, but here Malam, that is, an entirely different exigency, is already being announced. Let us for a moment call to mind Thomas Mann. His is an interesting case because he does not respect the rule of non-intervention. He constantly involves himself in what he is telling, sometimes through interposed characters, but also in the most direct way. What about this unwarranted intrusion? It is not moralizing, it is not a stand taken against a certain character, nor does it consist in illuminating things from the outset in the print of the creator's thumb as he shapes figures to his liking. It represents the intervention of the narrator challenging the very possibility of narration, an intervention, consequently, that is an essentially critical one, but in the manner of a game, a malicious irony. Flaubert's kind of impersonality, contracted and difficult, still affirmed the validity of the narrative mode, to tell is to show, to let be or to make exist, without the being reason despite the great doubts one may already have harder to question oneself about the limits and the workings of the narrative order. Thomas Mann knows very well that we have lost our naivete. He therefore tries to restore it, not by passing over illusion in silence but, on the contrary, by producing it, by making it so visible that he can play with it, just as he plays with the reader and in so doing draws him into the game. Thus with his great sense of the narrative feast, Thomas Mann succeeds in restoring it as a feast of narrative illusion, giving back to us an ingenuousness twice removed, that of the absence of ingenuousness. One could therefore say that if aesthetic distance is denounced in his work, it is also proclaimed, affirmed by a narrative consciousness that takes itself as a theme, whereas in the more traditional impersonal novel it disappeared, placing itself in parentheses. Storytelling was a matter of course. Of course storytelling is not a matter of course. As we know, the narrative act is generally taken in charge by a certain character, not that this character, by telling it directly, makes himself the narrator of a story that has already been lived or is in the process of being lived, but because he constitutes the center around which the perspective of the narrative is organized, everything is seen from this point of view. There is, therefore, a privileged eye, if only the eye of a character referred to in the third person who takes great care not to exceed the possibilities of his knowledge and the limits of his position. This is the realm of James's Empersaders, and it is also the realm of subjectivist formulas in which the authenticity of the narrative depends upon the existence of a free subject. These formulas are correct insofar as they represent the decision to stick to a certain bias, obstinacy and even obsession are among the rules that seem to impose themselves when it is a matter of writing a form is obstinate, this is its danger, but they are in no way definitive, on the one hand, they wrongly assert some sort of equivalence between the narrative act and the transparency of a consciousness, as though to tell were simply to be conscious to project, to disclose, to cover up by revealing, and on the other hand, they maintain the primacy of an individual consciousness that could only in the second place, and even secondarily, be a speaking consciousness. In the meantime, Kafka wrote. Kafka admires Flaubert. The novels he writes are marked by an austerity that might permit a distracted reader to rank them among Flaubert's descendants. Yet everything is different. One of these differences is essential to the subject that concerns us. The distance here the creative disinterestedness, so visible in Flaubert in as much as he must struggle to maintain it, a which was the writer's and the reader's distance from the work and authorized contemplative pleasure, now enters into the work's very sphere in the form of an irreducible strangeness. No longer questioned or re-established as something denounced, as in Thomas Mann, or Jide, this distance is the medium of the novelistic world, the space in which the narrative experience unfolds in its unique simplicity an experience that is not recounted but is in play when one recounts. This distance is not simply lived as such by the central character who is always at a distance from himself, just as he is from the events he experiences or the beings he encounters, which would still only be the manifestation of a singular self, this distance keeps him aloof from himself, removing him from the center, because it is constantly decentering the work in an immeasurable and indiscernible way, while at the same time introducing into the most rigorous narration the alteration occasioned by another kind of speech or by the other's speech, as writing. The consequences of this kind of change will often be misinterpreted. One consequence, immediately evident, is noteworthy. As soon as the alien distance becomes the object and, in a sense, the substance of the story, the reader can no longer be disinterested in it, he who up to now has been identifying from afar with the story in progress, living it, for his part, in the mode of contemplative irresponsibility, can no longer take a disinterested pleasure in it. What is happening? What new exigency has befallen the reader? It is not that this concerns him, on the contrary, it concerns him in no way and perhaps concerns no one, it is in a sense the non-concerning, but with regard to which, 
by the same token, the reader can no longer comfortably take any distance since he cannot properly situate himself in relation to what does not even present itself as unsituatable. How, then, is the reader to set himself or herself apart from the absolute distance that seems to have taken all distance up into itself? Without any bearings, deprived of the interest of reading, he is no longer allowed to look at things from afar, to keep between things and himself the distance that belongs to the gaze, because the distant in its non-present presence is not available either close up or from afar, it cannot be the object of a gaze. Henceforth it is no longer a question of vision. Narration ceases to be that which presents something to be seen through the intermediary of, and from the viewpoint of, a chosen actor spectator. The reign of circumspect consciousness or of narrative circumspection, of the eye that looks at everything around itself and holds it by its gaze has been subtly shaken, without, of course, coming to an end. What Kafka teaches you say even if this formulation cannot be directly attributed to him is that storytelling brings the neutral into play. Narration that is governed by the neutral is kept in the custody of the third person he, a he that is neither a third person nor the simple cloak of impersonality. The narrative he, ill backslash in which the neutral speaks is not content to take the place usually occupied by the subject, whether this latter is a stated or an implied I or the event that occurs in its impersonal signification. To the narrative he or it unseats every subject just as it disappropriates all transitive action and all objective possibility. This takes two forms. 1. The speech of the narrative always lets us feel that what is being recounted is not being recounted by anyone, it speaks in the neutral. 2. In the neutral space of the narrative, the bearers of speech, the subjects of the action of those who once stood in the place of characters so fall into a relation of self-non-identification. Something happens to them that they can only recapture by relinquishing their power to say I. And what happens has always already happened, they can only indirectly account for it as a sort of self-forgetting, the forgetting that introduces them into the present without memory that is the present of narrating speech. This, of course, does not mean that the narrative necessarily relates a forgotten event, or even the event of forgetting that dominates lives and societies, which, separated or as one still says, alienated or from what they are, move as though in their sleep seeking to recapture themselves. It is narrative, independently of its content, that is a forgetting, so that to tell a story is to put oneself through the ordeal of this first forgetting that precedes, founds, and ruins all memory. Recounting, in this sense, is the torment of language, the incessant search for its infinity. And narrative would be nothing other than an allusion to the initial detour it has borne by writing and that carries it away, causing us, as we write, to yield to a sort of perpetual turning away. The act of writing, this relation to life, a deflected relation through which what is of no concern is affirmed. The narrative he, or it, ill backslash, whether absent or present, whether it affirms itself or hides itself, and whether or not it alters the conventions of writing a linearity, continuity, readability thus marks the intrusion of the other who understood as neutral in its irreducible strangeness and in its wily perversity. The other speaks. But when the other is speaking, no one speaks because the other, which we must refrain from honoring with a capital letter that would determine it by way of a majestic substantive as though it had some substantial or even unique presence, is precisely never simply the other. The other is neither the one nor the other, and the neutral that indicates it withdraws it from both, as it does from unity, always establishing it outside the term, the act, or the subject through which it claims to offer itself. The narrative, I do not say narrating, voice derives from this its aphony. It is a voice that has no place in the work, but neither does it hang over it, far from falling out of some sky under the guarantee of a superior transcendence. The he, ill backslash is not the encompassing of jaspers, but rather a kind of void in the work of the absence word that Marguerite Giras evokes in one of her narratives, a whole word, hollowed out in its center by a hole, the hole in which all the other words should have been buried. And the text goes on, one could not have spoken it but it could have been made to resume the immense, endless, an empty gong. 3 This is the narrative voice, a neutral voice that speaks the work from out of this place without a place, where the work is silent. The narrative voice is neutral. Let us rapidly consider the traits that characterize it at first approach. For one thing, it says nothing, not only because it adds nothing to what there is to say, it knows nothing, but because the narrative voice subtends this nothing of the silencing and keeping silent a in which speech is here and now already engaged, thus it is not heard in the first place, and everything that gives it a distinct reality begins to betray it. Then again, without its own existence speaking from nowhere, suspended in the narrative as it only neither does it dissipate there in the manner of light, which, though itself invisible, makes things visible, radically exterior, it comes from exteriority itself, from the outside that is the enigma proper to language in writing. But let us consider still other traits, traits that are actually the same. The narrative voice that is inside only in as much as it is outside, at a distance without there being any distance, cannot be embodied. Although it may well borrow the voice of a judiciously chosen character, or even create the hybrid function of mediator, 
the voice that ruins all mediation, it is always different from what utters it, it is the indifferent difference that alters the personal voice. Let us, on whim, call it spectral, ghost-like. Not that it comes from beyond the grave, or even because it would once and for all represent some essential absence, but because it always tends to absent itself in its bearer and also efface him as the center, it is thus neutral in the decisive sense that it cannot be central, does not create a center, does not speak from out of a center, but, on the contrary, at the limit, would prevent the work from having one, withdrawing from it every privileged point of interest, even a focal, and also not allowing it to exist as a completed whole, once and forever achieved. Tacit, the narrative voice attracts language indirectly, obliquely and, under this attraction of an oblique speech, allows the neutral to speak. What does this indicate? The narrative voice bears the neutral. It bears the neutral in so far as, one, to speak in the neutral is to speak at a distance, preserving this distance without mediation and without community, and even in sustaining the infinite distancing of distancy of its irreciprocity, its erectitude or dissymmetry, for the neutral is precisely the greatest distance governed by dissymmetry and without one or another of its terms being privileged, the neutral cannot be neutralized. Two. Neutral speech does not reveal, it does not conceal. This does not mean that it signifies nothing, by claiming to abdicate sense in the form of nonsense, it means that the neutral does not signify in the same way as the visible invisible does, but rather opens another power in language, one that is alien to the power of illuminating, or obscuring, of comprehension, or misapprehension. It does not signify in the optical manner, it remains outside the light shadow reference that seems to be the ultimate reference of all knowledge and all communication to the point of making us forget that it only has the value of a venerable, that is to say inveterate, metaphor. 3. The exigency of the neutral tends to suspend the attributive structure of language, the relation to being, implicit or explicit, that is immediately posed in language as soon as something is said. It has often been remarked by philosophers, linguists, and political analysts so that nothing can be negated that has not already been posited beforehand. To put this another way, every language begins by declaring and in declaring affirms. But it may be that recounting, writing, draws language into a possibility of saying that would say being without saying it, and yet without denying it either. Or again, to say this more clearly, too clearly, it would establish the center of gravity of speech elsewhere, there where speaking would neither affirm being nor need negation in order to suspend the work of being that is ordinarily accomplished in every form of expression. In this respect, the narrative voice is the most critical voice that, unheard, might give to be heard. That is why, as we listen to it, we tend to confuse it with the oblique voice of misfortune, or of madness. 415. The Wooden Bridge, Repetition, The Neutral. If every narrative, under summons of the neutral or inciting it, is already a site of extravagance, we understand why Don Quixote so evidently opens the tormented age that will be us and not because it sets loose a new kind of eccentricity, but because, trusting ingenuously in the sole movement of recounting, it gives itself over to extravagance, and by the same token puts on trial denounces, what, after it, but perhaps only for a short time, we still call literature.1 what is this night's madness? It is our own, the madness of everyone. He has read a great deal and he believes in what he has read. In a spirit of perfect coherence, and faithful to his convictions, he is clearly someone engaged, he abandons his library and decides to live rigorously, the way one does in books, in order to learn whether the world corresponds to literary enchantment. We have, therefore, and undoubtedly for the first time, a created work that deliberately offers itself as an imitation. The hero who is central to all this may well present himself as a character of action who, like his peers, is capable of accomplishing feats of valor, but his feats are always already a reflection, just as he himself cannot but be a double, while the text in which his exploits are recounted is not a book, but a reference to other books. Upon reflection, it is clear that if there is some madness in Don Quixote, there is an even greater madness in Cervantes. If Don Quixote is not reasonable, he is nonetheless logical in thinking that the truth of books may also hold for life. And if he sets out to live like a book, this is a marvelous and deceptive adventure since the truth of books is deceptive. For Cervantes things are different because, unlike Don Quixote, he does not set out into the street to put the life of books into practice, rather, it is still into a book that he puts all his efforts, not leaving his library and doing nothing while he lives, acts, and dies other than writing or without living, and without either moving or dying. What does he hope to prove, and prove to himself? Does he take himself for his hero who, for his part, takes himself not for a man but for a book, and who nonetheless claims not to read but to live? A surprising madness, a laughable and perverse unreason that all of culture dissimulates, but that is also its hidden truth. The truth without which it would be unable to edify itself and upon which it does so majestically and vainly. But let us consider things more simply from another angle. We have read a book. We comment upon it. In commenting upon it, 
we perceive that this book is itself no more than a commentary, a setting into book form of other books to which it refers. We write our commentary and elevate it to the rank of a work. Become a thing published, a public thing, it will in turn attract a commentary, which, in turn, let us acknowledge this situation, so natural to us that it seems tactless to formulate it in these terms. As though, in bad taste, we were divulging a family secret. So be it, let us own up to such indelicacy. But I take one of the great merits of Mother Robert's book to consist in the questioning to which she leads us by an interrogation that is double or can be formulated twice, what about the speech that is commentary? Why are we able to speak about an instance of speech? Furthermore, can we, except by injuriously taking it to be silent, that is to say, by taking this beautiful work we revere as being incapable of speaking on its own? And what about those creative works that constitute for themselves their own exegesis? Do they reveal an impoverishment of literature, the advent of a decadent, belated, and exhausted civilization, the sentimental fastidiously repeating the naive? Or are they not, rather than more distant, closer to the literary enigma, not more reflective but more within the movement of thought and thus not duplicating literature, but accomplishing themselves by virtue of a more initial doubling that proceeds and puts into question the supposed unity of literature and of life? The speech of commentary, not all criticism is involved here in the various, though still confused, senses this word allows. It is a matter of repeating the work through a pretense that perhaps, in effect, envelops all criticism. But to repeat the work is to grasp at a hearer in it the repetition that establishes it as unique. Now this repetition of this originary possibility of existing doubly will not be reducible to the imitation of an interior or an exterior model. Be it the book of another writer or life, the life of the world, of the author, or the kind of project that would be the work in the writer's mind, already entirely written, but in a reduced model he would be content to transpose on the outside by enlarging it or reproducing it, taking dictation from the little man in him who is God. Replication presupposes a duplicity of another kind, the following, a work says what it says by silencing something, although not by affecting a secret, the work and the author must always say everything they know, hence literature can admit to no esotericism that is exterior to it are the only secret doctrine of literature being literature. Literature moreover says this by silencing itself. There is in literature an emptiness of literature that constitutes it. This lack or distance, unexpressed because covered over by expression, is that on the basis of which the work, while said one time, said perfectly and incapable of being said again, nonetheless irresistibly tends to say itself over again, requiring the infinite speech of commentary where, separated from itself through the beautiful cruelty of analysis, which, in truth, does not separate the work arbitrarily, but by virtue of the separation already at work in it are non-coincidence that would be its faint heartbeat, it awaits the silence that is proper to it to come to an end. Awaiting that is naturally disappointed. This repetition of the book by commentary is the movement thanks to which a new speech, new and yet the same, introduces itself into the lack that makes the work speak, claiming to fill it in or make it good. This is an important speech, finally we will know what is water we will know what is behind the great castle and whether the phantoms of the turn of the screw are mere phantasms born in the feverish mind of a young girl. A revealing, a usurping speech. For if the commentary of this is only too manifest a fills in all the interstices, or through this omnizing speech even completes the work, but, having abolished its space of resonance, renders it mute and is consequently in its turn struck dumb, or if it is content by its repetition to repeat the work on the basis of the distance within the work that is its reserve ear not obstructing it, but, on the contrary, leaving it empty, designating it by circumscribing it from afar or translating it in its ambiguity through an interrogation henceforth still more ambiguous since it bears this ambiguity, bears upon it, and ends by becoming dissipated in it are then what good is commentary? Yes. What good is it? Yet this what good is it is itself also superfluous, whether we judge it unavailing or dangerous, the necessity of repeating can in no way be eluded since it is not superadded to the work nor imposed solely by the habits of social communication. When commentators have not yet imposed their aim, as, for example, at the time of the epic, this work of redoubling is accomplished within the work itself and we have the rhapsodic mode of composition, that perpetual repetition from episode to episode, an interminable amplification of the same unfolding in place, which makes each rhapsode neither a faithful reproducer nor an immobile rehearser but the one who carries the repetition forward and, by means of repetition, fills in or widens the gaps, opens and closes the fissures by new periptea, and finally, by dint of filling the poem out, distends it to the point of lateralization. A mode of repetition that compromises the work no less than the first. The critic is a kind of rhapsode, this is what has to be seen, a rhapsode upon whom we rely, the work hardly done, to distract it from its capacity to repeat itself a power that comes from its origins and that, left to itself, would risk indefinitely undoing it. Or else the critic is a scapegoat, banished to the confines of the literary space and charged with every faulty version of the work so that the work itself may be affirmed, intact and innocent, 
in the soul copy we hold to be authentic or unknown, in fact, and probably non-existent and that we can serve in the archives of culture, the unique work, complete only if it is lacking something, where this lack is its infinite relation to itself, a plentitude in the mode of deficiency. But what, then, of those modern works that are their own commentary, and that refer not only to what they are but to other books, or, better yet, to the anony mouse, unceasing, and obsessive movement from which all books come? Do works such as these, which are thus commented upon from within, like Don Quixote, which is not simply an epic poem but the repetition of every epic and, consequently, also its own repetition and derision, not run the risk, if it is a risk and not a chance, of rendering difficult, impossible, or vain the exercise of every other commentary by virtue of the fact that in recounting they recount themselves at one remove. Indeed, might not the proliferation of such works entail a sort of end of criticism? The response is reassuring, for the contrary is the case. The more a work comments upon itself, the more it calls for commentary, the more it carries on relations of reflection, of redoubling, with its center, the more this duality renders it enigmatic. Such is the case with Don Quixote. Even more evidently, it is also the case with the castle. Who will not remember adding something to it and feeling guilty for having done so? What an abundance of explications and a frenzy of interpretation, what exegetical fury, be it theological, philosophical, sociological, political, or autobiographical. How many forms of analysis, allegorical, symbolic, structural, and even, anything can happen, literal. And so many keys, each employable only by the one who forged it, each opening one door only to close others. Where does this delirium come from? Why is reading never satisfied with what it reads, incessantly substituting for it another text, which in turn provokes another? It is because, Marine Robert states, the same thing happens with a book by Franz Kafka as with a book by Miguel Cervantes. The book does not consist in an immediate narrative, but in a confrontation of this narrative with all the books of the same type, which, though they may be of dissimilar age, origin, signification, and style, in advance occupy the literary dimension in which it, too, would like to find a place. To put this differently, the surveyor does not survey Maginari and still virgin countries but the immense space of literature, he thus cannot keep from imitating her and thereby reflecting her all the heroes who have preceded him into this space. In this way, the castle is no longer simply the unique work of a solitary writer but a kind of palimpsest in which can be reared a juxtaposed, intertwined, and at times distinct to all the versions of a millinery adventure, a sum and thus a resume of the universal library where at times one sees K. as the hero of a social novel, a failure who wants to get ahead via women, at other times as the hero of a serialized novel, the hero with a big heart, defender of the weak against the tyranny of a privileged caste, and at still other times as the hero of a fairy tale and, more precisely, of a new cycle of the saga of King Arthur's court, waiting, as rehearser of the Odyssey and as Ulysses' successor, to find his true role, which is to put to the test the epic of epics, and along with it, the great Homeric order, that is to say, Olympian truth. This is a design Martha Robert boldly attributes not to the fatality of reading that condemns every cultivated man to see everything through the decomposing prism of culture, but to Kafka himself, also a very cultivated man. A man, she says, who was attracted by the success of the Greeks at a critical moment of his life that moment when, having converted to Zionism and ready to leave for Palestine, he took on the task of understanding and classifying the monstrous archives of Western culture from which he could not exclude his own works. Let us reflect for a moment on this remarkable and, I think, entirely new thesis, that the meaning, the ultimate secret of the castle would lie in the fact that it is an imitation of the Odyssey and a critique of Olympian bureaucracy to a thesis that certainly has a strange ring at first. Let us reflect on it less to accept or refuse it than to grasp its principle, and to ask whether it might not be possible to apply it differently. Let us assume then that the surveyor, in an indirect and invisible manner, is struggling not only with the forces that the castle and the village represent, but also, through these forces and behind them, with the supreme instance that is the book, and with the infinite modalities that its approach, through oral and written exegesis, entails. We know very well that for Kafka the space of the book, due to the tradition to which it belongs and, in particular, due to the tormented epoch in which he writes his narrative, is a space that is sacred, dubious, forgotten, and at the same time a space of unlimited questioning, study, and research, since it has been the very fabric of Jewish existence for thousands of years. If there is a world where, in seeking the truth and the rules of life, what one encounters is not the world but a book, the mystery and the commandment of a book, this world is indeed Judaism, a world where the power of the word and of exegesis is affirmed as lying at the beginning of everything, where everything starts from a text and comes back to a tar unique book in which a prodigious sequence of books is rolled up, constituting a library that is not only universal but that stands in for the universe, and is even more vast, more profound, and more enigmatic. A writer in Kafka's situation and with the concerns that are his, whether he elude or lay himself open to them, 
cannot escape this question, how can a literary man, a man without a mandate, enter the close of the sacred world of the written? How, author without authority, can he claim to add a strictly individual word to that other, old, terrifyingly old word that covers, comprehends, and encompasses all things, all the while remaining hidden in the depths of the tabernacle from which it has perhaps disappeared? How can he add a word to this word that is infinite, that has always in advance said everything and in regard to which, ever since it was first pronounced, the messieurs of speech are no more than mute depositories so left only with the task of keeping it by repeating it, while others have only to listen to it by interpreting it. As a writer, he must to this is the irreducible exigency go all the way to the source of the written since he will only begin to write when he succeeds in engaging in a direct relation with this originary speech. But he has no means of approaching this high place, other than speaking, that is to say, writing and writing in this way in advance, running the risk through this speech that is premature, without tradition and without justification, of obscuring still more there, for him, impenetrable relations of the word and its meaning. But in proposing these remarks, let me immediately add that I am in no way proposing a new interpretation of the castle. Nor am I suggesting that K. is purely and simply the writer Franz Kafka. The castle the biblical word. The offices the Talmudic commentaries, the village the site of the faithful where the repeated word would be at the same time living and dead, in the same way that a commandment is just and authentic if one belongs to it from the inside, but otherwise deceptive, even absurd, should one approach it from the outset here pretending moreover to judge it, and to speak of it without having received prior instruction as necessarily happens to the writer of today who has no legitimacy other than the exigency of writing, which allows neither reference nor guarantee, just as this writ-in is not content with any relative satisfaction. It is simply fitting to note that, 1, in writing, and in questioning oneself about writing a we know with what breadth and what seriousness it is not, first of all, against the academic space of Homer's epic that Kafka must measure himself, but against 3,000 years of Judaic writing, 2, if, contrary to Don Quixote, the castle does not have the pre-existing world of books as its subject, K. is a land surveyor, neither a reader nor a writer, and if it does not directly ask the question of writing, it nonetheless contains this question in its very structure since the essential element in the narrative here that is, the essential aspect of K.S. peregrination consists not in K.S. going from place to place, but from exegesis to exegesis and from commentator to commentator, listening to each of them with impassioned attention, then breaking in and arguing according to an exhaustive method of examination that could easily be compared with certain turns of the Talmudic dialectic, let us name it this way for the sake of simplicity, and in specifying that according to those who are competent, the latter would be even more demanding than the one with which K. has to be satisfied. This, it seems to me, is all one has the right to propose. The castle does not consist of a series of events or peripte that are more or less linked, but of a never expanding sequence of exegetic versions that finally only bear upon the very possibility of exegesis itself or the possibility of writing, and of interpreting, the castle. And if the book stops unfinished, unfinishable, it is because it bogs down in commentary, each moment requiring an interminable gloss, each interpretation giving rise not only to a reflection, Midrash Halisha, but also to a narration, Midrash Haggadah, that must in turn be heard, that is to say interpreted at different levels, each character representing a certain level of speech, and each instance of speech, at its level, saying what is true without saying the truth. We are given assurance that K. might have put an end to the narrative by his half-justified death, but of what death could he have died? Not his own handsome death, but rather an exegetical death, the commentary of his death, and on condition of having been able to discuss and in advance refute all the possible interpretations of this end that is not personal, private, but merely general, official, registered in some text that is eternal and eternally forgotten. His march toward death and his march toward the word entailed the same steps, an advance toward death through speech and an advance toward speech through death, each anticipating and annulling the other, when one night, the last night of the narrative, he finds himself suddenly face to face with the possibility of salvation, is he truly facing his own salvation? Not at all. He is in the presence of an exegesis of salvation to which he can respond only through his weariness, an infinite weariness that is of the same measure as an endless speech. And in this there is nothing absurd, salvation can only come, if it comes, through the decision of a word, but the word of salvation will assure only a salvation in speech, one that is valid only in general, be it even an exception, and therefore incapable of applying to the singularity of existence in the latter reduced by life itself, and by the weariness of life, to speechlessness. Of course the castle, I insist once again, is not only this, it is just as much the force of its images, the fascination of its figures, and the decisive appeal of its narrative, these constitute its unique truth, a truth that seems always to say of itself more than anything one could say about it, thereby engaging the reader, but above all the narrator, in the torment of an endless commentary. Three. Thus we come back to our point of departure, 
which was to question ourselves about the necessity of repeating that the work contains within itself, precisely in the part of it that is silent. The unknown side that underlies the speech of commentary, this speaking about speaking, vertiginous pyramid constructed on a void of a tomba covered over and perhaps long ago forgotten. There is, of course, between the interior and the exterior commentary this evident difference, the first employs the same logic as the second but, on the inside of a circle traced and determined by literary enchantment, it reasons and speaks on the basis of a spell, the second speaks and reasons about this spell, and about the logic that is haunted by it and grafted onto it. But it seems that the castle and this is what makes for the force of such a worker holds within itself, as its center, the active and unilluminated relation between what is most interior and most exterior, between the art that sets into play a dialectic and the dialectic that claims to encompass art. In other words, it would seem to hold in itself the principle of all ambiguity, and to hold to ambiguity itself as a principle, ambiguity, the difference of the identical, the non-identity of the same, the principle of all language and the infinite passage from one language to another, as from art to reason and from reason to art. Hence the fact that all the hypotheses one might develop about this book appear as sound and as powerless as those that are developed within it are providing they preserve and prolong its infinite character. Which amounts to saying that in some sense all books from now on pass by way of this book. But let us attempt to come to a better understanding of what this means. In general, in reading this narrative, we allow ourselves to be caught up in the mystery that is most visible, the one that descends from the inaccessible site that is the hill of the Count, as though the entire secret of the void from out of which the commentary is elaborated were situated there. But if one reads more attentively, one soon notices that the void is situated nowhere and is spread out equally over every point of the narrative to which inquiry is directed. Why do all the responses bearing upon the relation between K? and the castle always seem insufficient, and such that they seem infinitely to exaggerate and infinitely to invalidate the meaning of this sight that the most reverent and the most denigrating judgments, do and do not suit. It is strange, one can go looking for the supreme designations that humanity has been perfecting for thousands of years to characterize the unique. One may well say, but the castle is grace, the grass lash the count, is got, as the identity of the capital letters proves, or it is the transcendence of being, or the transcendence of nothingness, Olympus or the bureaucratic administration of the universe. For yes, one may well say all this and, of course, in saying it endlessly dove deeper. The fact nonetheless remains that all these profound identifications, the most rich and sublime we have at our disposal, do not fail to disappoint us, as though the castle were always infinitely more than these are infinitely more and thus also infinitely less. What, then, is above transcendence, what below transcendence? Well, let us hasten to respond, as haste alone will caution the response. It is that before which all evaluation reveals itself to be inadequate, be it the highest or the lowest, that which, therefore, strikes all possibility of evaluating with indifference and, in so doing, challenges all the guardians of value, whether they be celestial, terrestrial, or demonic and whether their authority derive from reason, unreason, or sereason. Is this very mysterious? Certainly it is, but at the same time, I think, without mystery. Since each time we speak we put it into play, even though we end up when we try to speak of it by making its retreat, covering it over by our very expression. Let us choose for the moment to call it by the most modest, the most effaced, and the most neutral of names, precisely the neutral, because to name the neutral is perhaps is surely to dissipate it, but necessarily still to the neutral's benefit. Given these conditions, have we the right to suggest that the castle, the Count's residence, would be nothing other than the sovereignty of the neutral and the sight of this strange sovereignty? Unfortunately, one cannot say this so simply, although the most profound part of Martha Roberts' book, at least the one to which I most respond, is the part where she shows that the sovereign power is neither transcendent nor imminent semicolon 5 she shows that it is neutral, limiting itself to registering all the facts, and also the judgments that proceed and follow theme of the thoughts, the dreams, and all of this with a neutrality and passivity that the individual feels strangely as a weight and as an injustice. An important, perhaps a decisive remark. Only one cannot limit oneself to it because the neutral cannot be represented, cannot be symbolized or even signified, moreover it is everywhere, inasmuch as it is borne by the infinite indifference of the entire narrative, just as everyone, says Olga, belongs to the castle, from which it must be concluded that there is no castle. It is as though it were the infinite vanishing point from which the speech of the narrative, and within it all narratives and all speech about every narrative, would receive and lose their perspective, the infinite distance of their relations, their perpetual overturning and annulment. But let us stop here, for fear of engaging in our turn in an infinite movement. The fact remains that if the castle contains within itself what we call the neutral, contains it as its center, and the absence of any center, the act of naming it cannot remain entirely without consequences. Why this name? Why this name? Indeed is it a name? A might it be a figure? A then a figure figuring only this name? 
A and Y can a single person speaking, a single speech, despite appearances, never succeed in naming it? We are obliged to be at least two to say it. A I know. We have to be two. A but why two? Why two instances of speech to say a same thing? A because the one who says it is always the other. 16. Literature one more time. We should try one more time to grasp, perhaps not the traits proper to what literature is understood to be, but those that have ceased to belong to it. A at the risk of being a bit crude. A necessarily so. But a simple inventory might suffice. For example, the idea of the masterpiece has disappeared. When we speak of a masterpiece it is always out of convenience, facility, or respect for the past. Literature, in its obscure self-assertion, excludes the promotion of the work of art called a chef d'oeuvre. A perhaps because it also excludes the idea of a work, an oeuvre. A at least a certain idea of the work. Thus we know that the work counts less than the experience of the search for it, and that an artist is always ready to sacrifice the work's accomplishment to the truth of the movement that leads to it. A or that prohibits attaining it. Then what counts? The artist, the writer? A the artist is a creative personality, the literary figure is an exceptional existence, the poet as genie you so the hero are these fortunately no longer have a place even in our myths. Vanity, of course, remains, the literary tea continues to be in evidence. We still speak of great writers and artists. Yet no one attaches any importance to this, these old echoes are beginning to die out. Consider what the theme of immortality signified for so many centuries so the hope of posterity's AC claim and the word glory, already degraded in the desire to be known by all and for all time. Who today would dare to feel justified by the good fortune of having his ashes tomorrow in the pantheon? Yes, who would? Many perhaps, but let's disregard them. The idea of immortality has become devalued, while at the same time the belief in a beyond is wearing away. I grant that we are indifferent to the idea of survival. One who is conscious of what is at stake in becoming will be happier to disappear, Nietzsche already attempted to teach us this. Are we then, by way of compensation, to exalt the idea of actuality, as has been done, that is, seek the meaning of literature and art in the exigency of the present? A one must be absolutely modern. Rimbaud's and Baudelaire's summons, which inaugurated a new age or corresponded to a mutation in the arts by putting them in relation with the secret essence of something that would be the modern, certainly had great meaning. But even if the new retains its prestige, even if the provocative seeking of what lies ahead can still play a critical role for us, it represents nothing binding. The thought of being modern seems to us almost as strange as the idea of becoming classical or of falling in with a secure tradition. Why? We could try to find out, were it worth the trouble. As some words no longer suffice to convey what they are a sign of. The modern era presupposes relations that have been maintained between the present, the past, and the future, be these relations of opposition or of contrast. But let us imagine changes such that these relations would no longer have a directing force. We will now no longer be conscious of belonging to modern times, nor of opposing ourselves to an age that is past, the modern will in its turn be outmoded as a mode of becoming. When history turns, this movement of turning that implies even the suspension of history, in the name of a utopian truth, also revokes the tradition of the new. A rupture such that this interruption would constitute an event uninscribable in the continuity of memory, and would signify the interruption of the memorable if not the birth of a new memory. And one would have to think of literature as being bound up with this interruption, yet necessarily almost ungraspable by means of the categories that continue to be ours. So literature could no longer be content with simply being modern, even in the sense Baudelaire and Rimbaud intended, and even considering the gain that comes to us from what we call modern art. A we therefore also have to renounce the exigency of the alternative, literature will be modern or it will not be. A but by the same movement, renounce seeking to base our efforts on some tradition, and on the hope always secretly entertained, even by the most innovative of forming a happy synthesis between what was and what will be. Being classical in so far as one is modern is a seed that will no longer germinate. A one could perhaps say more precisely that by the secret constituting it, literature remains distinct from culture. To make a poetic quirk is not to make a cultural work, and the writer does not try to enrich the cultural patrimony. Culture can doubtless lay claim to literary acts, it absorbs them by introducing them into the ever more unified cultural universe that is its own, and where works exist as spiritual, transmissible, durable, comparable things that are in relation with the other products of culture. Here the work seems to have found its certainty and consistency, books are added to books in order to constitute that beautiful Alexandria no flame will ever reach, that always finished, always unfinished barbell that is the world of literature and literature as world. Let us recognize that the immense work of culture, which makes a whole of literature and makes literature an element within a larger whole, constantly furnishes us with an alibi. The consolidation of culture allows all writers and artists, in the current of ordinary life, to feel themselves still of use amidst the values they uphold by putting them in question. 
But let's maintain the idea that Kafka does not write to make a cultural work, nor does he write to check culture, any more than did Homer, any more than would the last writer that we all for a moment suppose ourselves to be. A to write to, or not to write to, is not sufficiently determining. Let us put it better by saying that, on the one hand, literature belongs to culture, since it can be studied as a fact of culture, but, on the other hand, what is affirmed on the basis of literature not only contests culture in what it values, but also escapes it and deceives it are if what literature communicates to culture with regard to its substantial contents is only an empty becoming, or if what culture succeeds in extracting from literature in order to study it immediately becomes substantialized, and thereby falls outside literature. A. Let us try to put this still more precisely. Literature is a language. Every language, as we formulate it today, is constituted by a signifier, a signified, and the relation of the one to the other. It is not sufficient to say, as Paul Valery for a long time affirmed, that form has more importance in literary language than in ordinary languages, it must first be said that in literary language the relation between signifier and signified, or between what one calls form and, erroneously, content, becomes infinite. A which means? A which means many things, too many for us to delimit them. It means essentially that this relation is not a relation that unifies, form and content are in relation in such a way that all comprehension, all efforts to identify them, to relate them one to the other, or to a common measure in accordance with a regularly valid order or with a natural legality, alters them and necessarily fails. From which for low consequence is so difficult to ascertain that we could never discover them all. Here is one of them, the signified can never be taken as being a response to the signifier, or as its end, but rather as that which indefinitely restores to the signifier its power to give meaning and to constitute a question, the reality of the content is there only to recharge form, to re-establish it as form, a form that, in its turn, is exceeded by a meaning that conceals itself and cannot fill it. Here is another, this infinite relation bearing the exigency of an infinite distortion will accomplish itself all the more as the terms between which it is produced give themselves as more distant, entailing from one to the other the strongest element of disjunction so that the relation between them does not have the effect of unifying them, but on the contrary prohibits all synthesis, thus affirming through the strangeness of this relation only the improbable becoming of signification in its infinite air that is to say, infinitely empty plurality. Hence one is able to conceive why this relation of strangeness seems to precede and to deceive every signification, and, at the same time, seems to signify infinitely and signify itself as infinite, and why the innermost meaning of every literary work is always literature signifying itself. A as though, in literary language, the signifier's emptiness functioned as positive and the content's reality as negative, so that the greater the difference of potential between the two conductors and the stronger the resistance to the point of tending to the infinite air the closer the work would come to signifying itself as literature. Let us suppose this, although there is much here to object to. But it seems to me that in limiting ourselves to this we have forgotten our point of depater, which was to establish why culture is able to lay claim to literature while the literary experience, at the limit, falls outside the field or the jurisdiction of culture. A perhaps we have not forgotten it. Perhaps now we are better able to say something about this difficult problem. For culture tends to conceive of and to establish as relations of unity relations that, on the basis of literature, give themselves as infinite, that is, irreducible to any unifying process. Culture works for the whole. This is its task, and it is a good one. Having the whole as its horizon, it retains all that contributes to the movement of the whole. A cumulative process. It therefore privileges results. For culture, a work's signification is its content, and what is set down and deposited in literary works, their positive side, is the representation or reproduction of an exterior or an interior reality. Literature communicates society, human beings, and objects to us in a manner that is proper to it. It is a volume in the encyclopedia. The ideal of culture is to bring off pictures of the whole, panoramic reconstitutions that situate in the same view Sconberg, Einstein, Picasso, Joyce are throwing Marx into the bargain, if possible, or better yet, Marx and Heidegger. Then the man of culture is happy, he has lost nothing, he has gathered up all the crumbs of the feast. A eh well, now we have kept our promise of being crude. I shall add this remark. A while back we evoked masterpieces, it is culture that loves and perhaps invents them, it needs them to simplify and facilitate reception of the contributions of the centuries. A masterpiece is a kind of concept, gathering together and resuming the reality of the numerous works for which it stands, and it is from the perspective of culture that certain books rise above the others to become at this altitude the visible sign of a whole. And yet, at the same time, culture aims to destroy the notion of the work. What interests culture is, properly speaking, what does not belong to the work of art? A because these two tendencies go hand in hand. Whoever wants masterpieces has never discerned what is at stake in the idea of the work of its secret difference, what constitutes it as always unperceived, non-produced, not set into work, 
the strangeness of its unworking. A. Let us then conclude that literature is not simply a manifestation of culture, which only holds on to results, and above all those that correspond to an established state of the world or some would say its most alienated part. But perhaps we might have avoided this lengthy detour simply by remarking that what is proper to the literary work is being creative, whereas what is proper to culture is to receive what has been created. The first gives, the second has to do only with what is already given, its work being to constitute in a kind of new natural reality the initiatives and the beginnings that, procured by the arts, tend to modify the state of things. I so that when one speaks of culture one would do better to speak of nature. Still, the idea of creation, though compelling, remains problematic. What does it mean to create? Why would the artist or the poet be the creator par excellence? Creating belongs to the old theology, and we are content to transfer the most common divine attribute to a privileged individual. To create something from nothing is the sign of power. To create a work, in so doing, not only to imitate the demiurgy of divinity, but also to prolong and re-establish the creative forces that once made the world, thus to take over for God. All these myths are indistinctly implied by the word creation when, as though by rights, we apply it to the labor of the artist. To which is added, mixed in with this word, the idea of natural growth, the power of unfolding and springing forth that belongs to nature. To create, to grow, to increase, to participate in the divine secrets that created nature, or in the secret of nature that creates itself in the play of metamorphoses I wonder why we accept, almost without question, such an inheritance of imposing ideas. A imposing, and perhaps excessively so. Upon further reflection, it might well come out that we use the term creator or creation only as a commonplace. In the Romantic period the artist takes his place at the summit and as though outside any social role, for what at this moment counts in the work of art is neither the work, nor art, but the artist and, in the artist, his brilliance and genius. The creator can even create nothing. He is the divine and absolute self that in itself bears the highest sovereignty, and this sovereignty need be neither socially recognized nor humanly productive. But just as the prestige attributed to inspired subjectivity has worn away, so has the idea of the creator become less distinct and with it, perhaps, the idea of creation as what properly characterizes art. A or it has been modified. What does it mean to create? We don't know, or no longer know, how this term would apply to literature. We might say that it seems too strong to us, too charged with received and poorly defined ideas, and also too laden with pretension in a word, too positive. We have become very modest. A that is to say, very mistrustful. Because the more the values of this world impose themselves upon us by their natural appearance and their look at positivity, the more we mistrust them, we mistrust their very power to posit, let alone create, processes by which something more is added to a reality that does not satisfy us. Whoever creates risks doing no more than conserving what is by enriching it, and even though he is admired, he already attracts our suspicion. Consequently, the interest we bring today to literature goes, if it goes anywhere, to its critical force let us say more precisely, to its mysteriously negative forces. Nietzsche, for whom the word creator retained all its attraction, already said that the true creator has the face of the destroyer and the malice of the criminal. A. Is this not to suggest that literature a foreign to culture, repugnant to the order of established values, revoking the criteria of tradition and even that of the modern, refusing to be creative in a world in which creating has no admissible signification or dangerously opens itself to a nihilist perspective, as certain impotent contemporary literary movements have shown? A. We could say so, if in speaking of nihilism we had the sense that we knew of what we were speaking. But nihilism is precisely one of those words that no longer suffices to convey what it points to. Perhaps what hides beneath this word and escapes every direct hold has its essence in this very movement of slipping away. A. Which amounts to sensing that nihilism, indistinguishable from its masks and nothing other than the false appearance of its false appearances, threatens us precisely when it reassures us, and never poses the most dangerous threat when the threat is most manifest. When, for example, nihilism joined forces with what was called Nazism or Fascism, it was doubtless not due to what in this movement had an openly negative signification, it never wanted to be seen as destructive, the destroyers were the others, the decadent, the Jews, the atheist Marxists, but rather through the positive values it advanced and that roused other values that are opposed, but related, the values of race, nationalism, force, the value of humanism, and, on both sides, the value of the West, at the same time, this movement claimed kinship with Nietzsche, not the Nietzsche who knew nihilism profoundly, but the Nietzsche who wanted to go beyond it, and precisely by caricaturing such possibilities of going beyond. The Ovenman, the will to power. I so it would be a matter of coming to maintain ourselves face to face, through an always more direct search, with what only assails us indirectly, as though Orpheus, as long as he did not turn around, thus accepting the infernal law of detour, had done nothing other than let himself be seduced by the nihilist illusion, incarnate, as is fitting, 
in his art and in its pretension to triumph over nothingness, that is to say, to assure triumph of nothingness by carrying along in its way all the forces of dispersion of hell. But he had the courage to look face on at the fascinating and fascinated thing, and he saw it was nothing, that the nothing was nothing, at which moment hell was really vanquished. An interpretation of the myth so reassuring and so tempting that I would be ready to see in it the very temptation to which Orpheus succumbed. Nihilism has always sought to lure us into challenging it immediately and to suggest we would come more openly to the end of it if we were to dare notice, looking straight on at the Medusa's head, that she herself is no more than a beautiful face with empty, already petrified eyes. A hence you would be inclined to conclude that at this moment nihilism itself is speaking through us. A when two partners in speech, renouncing all controversy, and through the play of redoubling and alternance, attempt to bring even the unknown to resumed, one of them perhaps necessarily assumes the role of nihilism. Only which of the two enters into this game? The one who admits it? The one who does not? Where is the other when two men come to speak, speaking in accord with what they cannot say directly? One of the two is the other, which is neither the one nor the other. As for nihilism, this dry and in any case Latin word, I think it has ceased to re-echo in the direction of what it cannot reach. So let us renounce employing it to situate what might come to us from literature that is, if what came from literature did not itself always in some sense hold itself back in it, and did not hold literature itself back and as though in retreat. At bottom, if to say plainly of literature that it is creative seems to us to be an indiscreet claim, to say that it is nihilist, or in league with some force of nothingness, is no less pretentious and indiscreet. To state it is sufficient to realize this. A there is still too much positivity in nothingness. The enormity of this word, like the enormity of the word being, has made both of them collapse beneath their ruins, ruins moreover still too easily turned to advantage. These are terms one would do well to be wary of. Literature, we discern, holds itself at a distance from any determination that is too strong, hence it is averse to masterpieces, and even withdraws from the idea of the work to the point of making the latter a form of worklessness. Literature is perhaps creative, but what it creates is always recessed in relation to what is, while this receding only renders what is more slippery less sure of being what it is, and because of this as though attracted to another measure, that of its unreality where in the play of infinite difference what is affirms itself, though all the while stealing away under cover of the no. Thus not really creative, but also not destructive through the violence of a decisive negation, for the absence literature produces is a kind of overfulness with regard to the real, and this effacement that comes from it, which is also within it as the movement that would efface it its own infinite questioning it does not really succeed in making it disappear, but rather affirms it through this disappearance leading it back toward the strangeness of that which gives origination and, at times, perhaps always, allows it in turn to become a thing, a thing full of itself, a self-imposing reality that claims to be of value in consolidating the reign of values. A. When I hear the word origin pronounced, a word the habits of time push toward us, I wonder why we so willingly call it to assist us when, concerning art, speech, and thought, we have some enigma in view. Is it because it is itself enigmatic? Is it because it would hold within itself the word of the enigma its answer? A. If it holds it, it does not hand it over. Note that as regards the notions we have stirred up so as to seize this possibility that is literature, we have each time sensed that it was ready to rouse itself in the background. Were it a matter of the tradition, we could have said with a certain philosopher, tradition is the forgetting of the origin. Or we could have called it a forgetting of the modern, and then we could have said with another, to live in the modern world is to detach the real from its origin. Or again, were it a matter of the idea of creation, we would have rediscovered behind this idea, before any theological reminiscence and justifying its prestige, the relation with the origin. And it is not merely this power of destruction or effacement at work in literary speech that would lay claim to this obscure origin, not only because, in relation to everything established, an originary perturbation ruins and prevents any subsistence, but because the origin itself, excluding in its unrecoverable anteriority all that is born of it, is, not being, but rather what turns away from it are the harsh breach of the void out of which everything arises and into which everything sinks and gives way, the very play of the indifferent difference between arising and giving way. A so when we pronounce the word origin, we do no more than gather into a privileged word all the traits that constitute the enigma in our research. All these traits perhaps converge, in fact, toward this word, which is in turn the center of all divergency or, to state this more precisely, divergence itself as the center of every relation. A center that in this case is the absence of any center, since it is there that the thrust of all unity comes to be shattered, in some sense the non-center of non-unity. This amounts to maintaining the origin itself under the harsh interrogation of the absence of origin, which, as soon as the origin poses as the cause, the rear sun, and the word for the enigma, immediately deposes it and speaks as a more profound enigma, the arising that, as such, sinks down, is engulfed and swallowed up. A which amounts therefore to rejecting this reference to the origin to which we had hoped to limit ourselves. 
I cannot help but remark that we have overturned and defaced, one after another, and in a rather disappointing movement, all the traits we have evoked in order to grasp what is at play in literature. A perhaps because literature is essentially made to disappoint, being in some sense always wanting in relation to itself. And, it is true, the word masterpiece, then the words work, posterity, glory, and culture, the words creation and being, destruction and nothingness, and finally the word origin have each in turn offered themselves and retired but perhaps each time not being entirely erased, leaving in this movement of withdrawal a trace and an almost ineffaceable trait. Thus the masterpiece disappeared, leaving in its place the work understood as its own self-elevation, and in its turn the work disappeared, leaving in its place the affirmation of the work as non-produced, idle, the experience of worklessness, in the place of the idea of the modern there was left the idea of a more profound rupture signifying the suspension of anything memorable, as for culture, it has helped us to conceive of literature as the language in which the relation between form and content becomes infinite, that is to say, the most rigorous and the most tailitary, the affirmation of a rigor and an arbitrariness, finally, the idea of creation and destruction has led us to the idea of origin, which has seemed almost by itself to efface itself, leaving us, as a sign, the idea of difference, of divergence as a first center. This is little, I admit. Nonetheless, it seems to me that an indication remains, an Ariadne's thread that, at each turn of the labyrinth, has allowed us not to lose ourselves definitively. This idea, so many times proposed and always displaced, is that there would be at play in literature some affirmation irreducible to every unifying process, not permitting itself to be unified and itself not unifying, not provoking unity. This is why we can grasp it only indirectly through a series of negations, for it is always in terms of unity that thought, at a certain level, composes its positive references. This is also why literature, if it is made to disappoint all identity and to deceive comprehension as a power of identification, is not really identifiable. That beside all the forms of language in which the whole constructs and speaks itself a speech of the universe, speech of knowledge, of labor and of salvation a one shall always sense an entirely different speech, liberating thought from being always only a thought in view of unity this is perhaps what would still remain for us at the bottom of the crucible. A at least momentarily. A plus minus plus after the last momentary word, let us suppose, by a decision that is clearly legitimate and of pure pretension, that literature is dismissing us, which would also mean that literature, here unemphasized, has hold of us in this movement of illusion and belonging. This was surrealism's reason, and its madness, in interrogating it no longer in relation to what comes to an end, but with the question of the future that designates itself in this end that is infinite, we will be outside the closure of time, also more enclosed than ever by this opening of the space where are inscribed anew the names that define it as they indetermine it, concepts that would like to escape all conceptualization, at the very moment when knowledge, already rediscovering them, recuperates them and even turns them back over to culture it is true after the discretion of a long silence. I place them here in the safekeeping of the absence of the book that is their ruin as well as their advent. 17. Tomorrow at stake. One cannot speak of what was neither a system or a school, nor a movement of art or literature, but rather a pure practice of existence, a practice of the whole bearing its own knowledge, a practical theory, in a determinate temporal modality. One in the past tense, it would constitute a history, a fine story. The history of surrealism is only of scholarly interest particularly if the conception of history is not modified by its subject, and nothing up to now has appeared to justify evoking such a possibility. And as for the present or the future, just as one cannot claim that surrealism has been realized, thus losing more than half of what names it, everything in it that goes out ahead of it, neither can one say that it is half real or on the way to realization, in becoming. What constitutes surrealism as an absolute summation, and a summons of such urgency that through it, be it in a most fortuitous manner, waiting opens itself to the unexpected, also prohibits us from trusting solely to the future for it to be accomplished or take form. To speak of surrealism and each of us would like to understand it are is to speak of it without authority and in a subdued tone, addressing no one, though still perhaps he who crossed the frontier and broke the last solitude. This is not to speak of it as of a common good, common to whom? Or as a property it is not the good and it belongs to no one. I presume only that those who are perilously invested with the power to represent it know that even if it possesses no present, no future, and no past, surrealism can at any moment rise up before them and demand justice, requiring a form of accomplishment in accordance with the meaning they will have given it. There is no last judgment other than this exigency by virtue of which the invisible, something that does not exist, will be measured by the works, the actions, the silence, and the practical resolution, that is to say the joint play of life and death of all those who will have claimed to have given it evidency. A manifestation of the non-manifest. As a realism we cannot sense its destination otherwise is and has always been a collective experience. This is its first trait. Here we may suspect that Andre Breton's role was different from the one that is recognized through admiration, 
affection, or personal ill will as having been his. He was neither a master nor a guide, neither the leader of a party nor the head of a religion, any more than a simple arbiter or genius who would have taken the place of all the others through his innocent superiority, founding a coherence and an existence where, without him, there would have been only the stirring of a few dreams or a confrontation of ardent wishes. If he was predominant, he was so outside the group, through his books, his prestige, and his radiant authority, his manner of being truthfully present everywhere. Perhaps, however, within surrealism, he had the particular power not of being the one any more than the others, but of making surrealism each one's other, and in the attraction of this other taken as a living presence absence, a beyond the day at the horizon of a space unknown and without a beyond, of living it with friendship in the most rigorous sense of this exacting term, making the surrealist affirmation, in other words, a presence or a work of friendship. Were the surrealists, then, no more than a group of friends? And should their mutual understanding, as well as their separations, be considered simply as the vicissitudes belonging to human relations, where what is involved is first action of persons. Not in the least. Let us try to understand this more fully. Surrealism is always a third party in the friendship, an absent third term through which passes and through which issues this relation of tension and passion that effaces characters as it gives rise to and motivates initiatives and attractions. Whoever falls short of surrealism, its coldest truths as well as its most burning affirmations, falls short of this friendship and excludes himself from any possibility of encounter, no matter whether he be companion or brother. It is not in the name of betrayed friendship that the exigency in play strikes those who place themselves outside the game, it is rather this exigency itself, making possible or impossible the relations that the rapprochements, encounters and exchanges determine at the level of the everyday, that leads them to a rigorous friendship, but a friendship always revocable, always short of what the surrealist demand might ask of it. Let us think these things differently. Surrealism, a collective affirmation, a strange plurality. Of what kind? It is hard to be several. Speech does not suffice, unless one is content with a pure chatting, a melancholic alibi, it sometimes consents to become. But in this case one speaks so as not to speak to or, at best, one exchanges information, comments upon and prepares events and public demonstrations, all mediocre forms of sociability. Let us admit to seeing in the surrealist initiative as of the sleep, the games, and the various forms of its experience here an entirely new means of communicating and such that, thanks to these, one can communicate without passing through ordinary speech and without isolating oneself in writing. Of course it is not simply a matter of using up time while being together. Communication to employ this dubious word is communication with the unknown. But communicating with the unknown requires plurality. Let us continue with this hypothesis. From the unknown what is neither the pure unknowable nor the not yet known there comes a relation that is indirect, a network of relations that never allows itself to be expressed unitarily. Whether it be called the marvelous, the surreal, or something else that which, in any case, disavows transcendence as well as immanence, the unknown provoke as if in fact, in what way? It is provoked a non-simultaneous set of forces, a space of difference and, to speak like the first surrealist work, a magnetic field always free of the itinerary it calls forth, embodies, and nonetheless holds in reserve. The surrealist affirmation thus affirms this multiple space that does not allow itself to be unified and never coincides with the understanding that individuals, grouped around a faith, an ideal, or a labor, might sustain in common. Perhaps the future of surrealism is bound to this exigency of a plurality escaping unification and extending beyond the whole, while at the same time presupposing it, demanding its realization, untiringly maintaining, in the face of the unique, contradiction and rupture. What would therefore distinguish this group from other groups of political cells, religious sects, study groups, literary or philosophical associations, colleges come together around an aim or persuasion, or groups forming only to give momentary rise to group neuroses, perhaps also in order to study the may is surely this trait, being several not to accomplish something, but without any reason, even one hidden, other than to make plurality exist by giving it new meaning. A meaning that is betrayed by all the words indicating the movements of gathering, collectivity, association, religion, and, first of all, group. Let us say, zoorealism, an affirmation that is not collective, but plural or multiple dot to this perpetual affirmation perpetual dissuasion and dissidence, involves in the first place language, it should therefore come as no surprise to see surrealism almost exclusively concerned first with the question of language. Not because the surrealists would simply be impenitent literary types but because speaking, that is to say, writing, presupposes this space, just as living a desire ringer at every moment either frees it or reduces it, according to the conditions of existence that are offered to human beings, and first of all by society. Surrealism slash should come as no surprise a thus encounters writing, and through this encounter defines itself. But this is a writing of another kind. 
that the first purely surrealist attestation was produced in a kind of anonymous fashion through a double movement of writing that had no other aim than a freeing of the space, the magnetic field, that was affirmed by so-called automatic writing of this is what Andre Breton, despite the disappointments and with a profound understanding of the radical change it provoked, always rightly held to be the essential initiative, the inaugural decision. Language has been given to man so he may make surrealist use of it automatic writing, a writing freed from the logic of the logos, refusing everything that puts it to work and that makes it available to work, is the very proximity of thought, also the affirmation that affirms it, always already inscribed without transcription, a tracing without traces, the textual. Hence a network of necessarily contradictory formulations. Here are a few of them. Thought dictates. Automatic dictation means not that saying reproduces what is thought, but rather, one, thinking is always already a saying, a sign of what in advance destines itself to writing. Two, it is a matter of thought, the actual, real functioning of thought, not of a self who thinks, and thus this saying, without interdiction and without reference to a unique power or capacity to say, does not take its resources from the initiative of the subject, but rather refuses the notion of talent, as it does that of the magisterial work, the masterpiece, and also the notions of oeuvre, of culture, and even of reading. For writing is not reading, a giving to be read or making legible, no one knows ahead of time whether or not automatic writing will be situated at the level of pure unreadability. 3. The real functioning of thought. The word real is most unfortunate when it is a matter of proposing the surreal, real must be put in relation with the expression that defines it more precisely, as when, further on, allusion is made to the disinterested play of thought. This disinterest signifies that exterior preoccupations are aesthetic, saying well, as well as moral, acting well, willing well they are suppressed, and then, with them, everything that constitutes the self as it is protected by censure and the guarantee of repression. Disinterested play is pure passion. The thought that stands under the allurement of desire and as the intensity of what cannot appear, cannot transpire. But read. Authentic thought. Non-distorted, non-enclosed, non-alienated. Primitive thought. The real is the temptation to which surrealism risks succumbing when it lends itself to a search for the immediate. Andre Breton says with a magnificent humility, believe more and more in the infallibility of my thought as it relates to myself, and this with good reason. Nonetheless, in the writing of this thought, where one is at the mercy of the least external distraction, one may also fall into the soup. It would be inexcusable to try to hide this. Thought, by definition, is strong and incapable of catching itself at fault. By definition but when is thought equal to its definition? When is it what is essentially strong, the force that cannot fail? The very energy that not only passes into writing but, dispersing in it, becomes the movement of writing in its infinitude. Can one then affirm of thought that it is, or that it is real? Such words are too weak to designate the thought that is strong and never fails since they only refer us back to what, within surrealism, will constantly be on trial, not only vulgar realism but also empiricism and, through empiricism, all the customary forms of experience. One of the great surrealist initiatives is precisely to have separated empiricism and experience, reality and knowledge. It nonetheless remains a fact that the equivocacy of the word real and the temptation of what is apparently easy in the immediate is responsible for the link that will be established between automatic writing and the demand for continuity. As though thought to an inexhaustible murmur, a self-presence in even, uninterrupted becoming, a voice from the moment of awakening and even in sleep, always speaking and always to be heard did not cease communicating, and were in unceasing communication with everything, continuous with the whole. And how, when speaking of the real, can one imagine that there might be holes in what is, a lack in the universe, a void that would not be repugnant to nature. Hence this ideology of the continuous from which we are just beginning to disengage ourselves, and for which surrealism, reduced by some to a kind of Bergsonism, is less responsible than it is its victim, as was Freud and as were so many scientific, political, and sociological conceptions. An ideology easy to summarize in as much as it consists of two propositions, the world of the real is continuous, the discontinuous is the continuous such as it comes to man who has insufficient means to know it and formulate its expression. The continuous refers to the plenitude of being, the discontinuous comes from knowing, sign of our destitution, whereas, understood more rigorously, both the continuous and the discontinuous are signs of different problematics, one surreptitiously identifying reality with a model of the continuous so that it takes not as a model but as what alone is really real, the other affirming that knowing is not the alteration and diminishment of being, being less something, but rather the less that, coming forth under determined conditions of language and thought produces this new modality, this radical change and prodigious surplus that is the effect of speech and knowledge that has never yet been known. Andre Breton may well say, but in vain, perhaps the surrealist voice will be stilled, I have given up trying to keep track of those disappeared. The flux, the linear continuity of words, uninterrupted poetry, 
will be attributed to surrealist efforts and will thereby risk thwarting the search for an affirmation that stands in a distant relation with the unknown, that which is not measured by unity, and be it even anterior to it, always extends beyond, separates from and disarranges the whole. Automatic writing, a writing without anyone writing, passive, that is to say, a writing of pure passion, indifferent because bearing in itself every difference, thought writing, not thought written for and over which there can be no master since it excludes mastery, just as it refuses any possibility of being brought into play other than as a disinterested play of thought, thought representing nothing, a fortuitous presence that plays and that permits play. Play, a word designating the only seriousness of any worth. Play is the provocation by which the unknown, allowing itself to be caught up in the game, can come into relation. One plays with the unknown, that is to say, with the unknown as the stakes. Chance is the sign. Chance is offered by way of encounter. The aleatory introduces into thought as well as into the world, into the real of thought as into exterior reality, what is not found, what is encountered only through encounter. Automatic writing, then, is the infallibility of the improbable, what by definition does not cease coming about and yet only comes about exceptionally, in uncertainty and outside every promise, at all times but in a time impossible to determine, that of surprise. Through the aleatory a relation is therefore produced that is no longer founded on continuity. Andre Breton and Paul Illoud say this in their joint note on poetry what is created are hiatus and lack five a thereby discrediting the conception of a homogeneous plenitude that would in some way really be transported into language and that language would immediately give to be read. Rupture, lack, lacuna, this is the textual web, that of the inside and the outside. The capillary tissue, to which we accede through poetry's inaccessibility. The search for the immediate, terms that carefully contradict each other, passes by way of the indirect dot six say that subjective emotion, whatever its intensity, is not directly creative in art, that it has value only in so far as it is reinstated in, and incorporated into, the emotional depths that the artist is called to draw upon. And further on, providing it avoids the temptation to communicate the emotional process directly, political position of today's art, 1935. When we evoke now, communicating vessels, and mad love, written of course by Andre Breton and on the basis of himself, but subject to surrealism's intervention which constantly announces itself in them as a danger impossible to bear and here we immediately discover the changes of which these texts are the sight. In refusing, on the one hand, the genre of the novel, guilty of inventing without invention, and, on the other hand, refusing every other genre, guilty of not inventing, and also without saying the true, it is not to an aesthetic concern that André Breton wishes to respond, it is rather a much more decisive mutation he has in view. In this sense, Na is the grand adventure that we are far from having considered in all it asks of us, and in all that it promises. There is first this difficulty, the text, let us call it a narrative, has the character of an account that records. What occurs in the narrative has occurred in actual fact. Something takes place there that took place at a time sometimes specified by a date, as one tears a page from a calendar, and in places photographs render present, while withdrawing them from verbal fluctuation. The narrative excludes fiction, it belonging to the category of books that are left ajar like doors, and whose keys don't have to be sought. Consequently, everything is simple, the author makes known to us a particularly important moment of his life, which means that what is important is the real event whose poetic evocation is the book. Perhaps through simplicity and the marvelous transparency that at certain times was his privilege, André Breton would have accepted such a version of things. Yet even in accepting it he would not have consented to it, and even less would the book. We say, a real event, but of what sort? Such that, having been lived and continuing to be lived, it could only find its sight in the space opened by the movement of writing. A book, a simple book, one will say, yes, but one that is neither a book of fiction nor that simply imparts information, so already from this point of view a book that is other, absent, this event is the encounter. The encounter with Na is the encounter with encounter, a double encounter. Naturally, Na is real, Varei, or, more precisely, she is not real, Varei, she remains apart from every interpretable truth signifying only the unsignifying particularity of her presence, and this presence is that of encounter brought forth by chance, taken back again by chance, as dangerous and fascinating as it is, and finally vanishing in and of itself, in the frightening between two opened by the aleatory between reason and unreason. But this encounter that necessarily takes place in the continuity of the world is given precisely in such a way that it breaks this continuity and affirms itself as interruption, interval, arrest, or opening. Real, this young woman without a name, very shabbily dressed walking with her head held high and so fragile that she scarcely touches the ground as she goes. The present of the description is not that to represent her, but to accentuate in a decisive manner the entrance on stage of presence, namely, the arrival on the scene of what is simply there, without justification, without proof, and on the basis of which the condition of real and present things will be definitively or momentarily changed. 
as though the encounter its chance, the chance of Nietzsche or of Malam, be this the hiatus between several levels of reality, between several systems of determination, between the outside and the inside, or between diverse fields of knowledge, or else the impossible return to unity and the paradoxically unique manifestation of difference, given in a single stroke, a single moment and in one place a opened in this world in which things come about a distance without term wherein what arrives in an abrupt manner and like by lightning, Malam would say, is the non-coming itself. But this unarriving of the encounter, this not in space impossible to undo, and all the more so as its center is emptiness, the spacking that renders intercolory everything that claims to fill it, is the space where writing maintains, unfolds, and again refolds the difference in the essential plurality tie that has been entrusted to it, and in a sense consciously, by surrealism. To such a degree, or so fatally, that the encounter with Na, a real encounter with a real young woman, a young woman really delivered over to the unreality of what is called madness, is, as though in advance and in the brilliance of a ravaging fate, destined to the exigency of writing are even to the point that this marvelous moment of life, a toss of the dice that will not come about a second time, is staked, and fatally lost, in a preliminary narrative whose master, as he well knows, is not in the least Andre Breton, who is merely the lure of the trap in which he himself just missed being caught. The encounter, what comes without advent, what approaches face on, and nonetheless always by surprise, what requires waiting and what waiting awaits but does not attain. Even at the innermost heart of anteriority, it is always eruption of the outside, exteriority shaking everything. The encounter pierces the world, pierces the self, and in this opening, everything that happens, not happening, coming about with the status of what has not arrived, is the reverse side that cannot be lived of what on the right side cannot be written, a double impossibility that by a supplementary act to a fraud, a kind of falsehood, also a madness must be transformed in order to adapt it to living and writing reality. As when one pretends to bring death into the game here for surely one of the most certain and the most indecisive forms of encounter is dying stealing away. The encounter encounters us. Objective chance, fortuitous necessity, in the Hegelian sense, is certainly insufficient to account for what is at stake in this sentence. As in the Hegelian totality, what is separated a contraresa gives evidence of an anterior identity and announces a terminal identification, time being nothing but the passage of the first simplicity to the second, so in the same way the chains of distinct causalities, constituting a kind of sequence without relation, come to intersect at a point that appears to be fortuitous because the knowledge of the whole determining it is lacking, even though these chains of causality are nonetheless ideally one, never being foreign to the principle of unity that makes their coinciding not an irreducible strangeness but a promise of coherence or a reminder of concordance. The encounter encounters us. What is striking is not, as Cornot said in a definition that was famous at school, that two independent series of the tile, the passabio emerging from out of the furthest improbability, should meet via the independence of their conditions, it is not even that the supposed consequency of death while being rigorously determined, should, as such, remain without a proper determination, without the determination capable of accounting for its meaning. Or perhaps this has to be expressed differently, to say nevertheless the same thing. The encounter designates a new relation. At the point of juncture a unique pointer what comes into relation remains without relation, and the unity that thus comes to the fore is but the surprising manifestation, a manifestation by surprise, of the UN unifiable, the simultaneity of what cannot be together, from which we have to conclude, even should this ruin logic, that where the junction takes place it is disjunction that reigns over unitary structure and causes it to shatter. Therefore chance the aleteria does not simply put in question two determinations of a different order, a causality, a finality, or two locally autonomous and qualitatively distinct series, nature, history. These two series, it may be a matter of the meeting of two instances of freedom, Na and her companion, whether homogeneous or not, cease being so at their point of intersection. It is this heterogeneity of phenomena, their radical distance at the very site of their crossing, that sanctions the brilliance of their difference or if one prefers to formulate it differently, infinite exteriority, the non-contemporaneity of what is given in the unity of presence is the mystery of chance, its revelatory element. The encounter, therefore, designates a new relation because at the point of coincidence which is not a point but a divergence it is non-coincidence that intervenes, that affirms itself in the intervening, l'intervenue. To again refer back to the deceptive example of the tile and the passerby, there is a level of reality at which the two movements, that of the fall, mat of the passing are but two trajectories that come to intersect. Now, in this schema, what falls never kills anyone because the idea of death is not involved. To put this differently, the object as such never reaches the passerby as such, but only an hour bit to removing object, it is elsewhere, in another time that the passerby passes and dies, dying, in the proper sense of this word, by chance, and through chance, as though at the end of a game of dice whose outcome for him would have been unfavorable, supposing death was not his wish. A curious formulation. Let us accept it for the moment. 
it has the merit of showing the hiatus that holds the two fields apart even as they coincide, thus what introduces the thought of chance is this hiatus wherein is lodged, through recurrence, and for the sake of filling it in, the mortal possibility called the stroke of fate. So in this case, in order to kill there must be, 1, a determining cause, 2, the absence of a determinate cause and it is the absence of cause that always causes death, this lack that signifies a rupture of continuity. And thus chance, the indeterminate that indetermines. It is in this lack that obscure desire, the desire that cannot realize itself as desire, seeks and finds its sight. Who would not be tempted to believe that where clear intention slips away it is the hidden interference of desire that denounces itself, belatedly claiming necessity as though it had itself established it and set it in place ahead of time. Chance is desire, which means either that desire desires chance, inasmuch as it is elitary, or that desire seduces chance so as to render it unconsciously similar to what is desired a form of magic, therefore, that for a time was surrealism's temptation. But now withdraws precisely from magical reconciliation, just as she slips out of amorous reach. This is why her adventure is the most decisive. The fascinating, enigmatic point, her companion, he who walks beside her, is unable to come to an understanding with her in the allure that comes from her presence. There is a dissymmetry in the encounter, an essential discordance between the terms that come face to face. What approaches face on is also absolutely turned aside. It comes by surprise, arbitrarily and necessarily, the arbitrariness of Nessie's city, unexpected by reason of the waiting. I don't know why it should be precisely here that my steps take me, here that I almost always go without specific purpose and without anything determining it other than this obscure clue, namely that it, will happen here. It, sailor, the very specification of what is in the encounter, the neutral of the unknown. The neutral of the unknown that is always in play in encounter allows the encounter to come about only in order immediately to put its realization at stake. This is the breathless, exhausting pursuit. Now is always encountered a one must always recommence encountering here are always withdrawn as soon as she offers herself, destined to slip away, and even in her disappearance that is as uncertain and even more obscure in her manifestation, which does not abolish the event, but takes place in the same space of the non-place a of encounter. Hence this thought, this questioning hope, would not know, this name that is but a half name, giving her a visage, a voice, a presence here would she not be this indecisive sailor? The very unknown that, in the world, but disturbing the world, would allow itself to be observed so as to make the surrealist affirmation, in the full light of day, tangible and real. How simple this would be, and how well one understands why Andre Breton would wish to believe this, and would wish also to convince her of it are but in vain. The unknown is never but an interloper, that is, a third party in default, ever exterior to the horizon against which it seems to stand out, always different from the enigma by which, enigmatic, it would give itself over to knowledge. In the relation thus offered neither of them encounters what they encounter, Andre Breton is for her a god, the sun, the dark and lightning struck man close to the sphinx, for him, she is the genie of the air, inspired inspiring, she who always departs. The unknown thus acquires its character of beauty and height, which fixes it at a certain level a level both reassuring and stirring her of irreality. But that now should also be mile. D. Who makes idle, tiresome remarks, who persists in misplaced coquetteries and low, lamentable adventures from which her dignity does not emerge intact, that she, in a word, is the one who falls a at this moment the unknown, perhaps precisely at this time closest to being lived, steals away and revokes itself without leaving any other trace than this deranged everydayness, and here the common sense of the word derangement, which is also the most impressive, comes appropriately to name the event in completing its alteration. What does all this signify? The misunderstanding a let us immediately set aside all that might be offered to account for it in the way of differences of character or even, due to their personalities, the protagonist's incapacity to be up to the event is not the accidental and regrettable effect of an encounter in every other respect marvellous, misunderstanding is its essence and, as it were, its principle. Where no understanding is possible, where all that happens happens outside understanding and is therefore fascinating a terrible or marvel also and with no relation other than the intimacy of the absence of relation, it is here that the experience of encounter deploys its dangerous space, a field that is non-unified, non-legalized, and without set paths, where life is no more given at the level of the real than writing, accomplice of that life, is present in the language where the real is articulated. The experience here danger itself, a gap through which life, far from interrupting itself in the living being so that the latter, as a good writer, can do his work, rather doubles itself in a sense in order to expose itself to this interruption, being then free for an instant of its conditions of stability and security, that is to say, free of its order and its future as from its present and past so that one may live it, without, however, since it is only a matter of a burning non-presence and a violent lack, ever being able to claim having lived it, an interruption that the one who writes receives and retains without knowing, for his part, 
whether the silence found there but is it silence? A was from the outset given to him in this suspended and heightened moment of life, or, on the contrary, whether he writes only in order that this silence might occur, a silence without which the encounter did it take place, will it take place? A would be deprived of all communicable reality. An experience that is therefore not only an experimentation, the action of writing on life, but an experience of that which does not obey the reigning order of experience, and, without taking the form of a new order, holds itself between the two between two orders, two times, two systems of signification and of language, the ordeal, therefore, of what is given neither in the arrangement of the world nor in the form of the work, and thus announcing itself on the basis of the real as derangement, and on the basis of the work as unworking a, a practice of life and of writing in which we thought we recognized one of the characteristic traits of the surrealist project. Derangement, or becoming as the energy of intermittence, is at work, but produces no work. It is not outside what can be tested, but its attestation is always an attestation of default so that attestation, in its case, does not consist in observing it as though it were inscribed in a perceptible state of the world or a reality and, as such, adhering in an object offered to a gaze, or to the introspection of a subject. Disarrangement, derangement is invisible, this means that it blocks the direct relation light seems to authorize and that unduly organizes knowledge, just as it reduces all speech to the model of sight and the thing to be seen, this means as well that it never merges with the trace it leaves or with the phenomenon that bears a tar trace or a phenomenon always belonging to one or another time, to one or another system. When one remarks it, it cannot be established, when one makes it speak, it refers to a without speech that is nonetheless language in as much as the latter only speaks in preceding itself or in tearing itself away from itself. It interrupts itself, it turns aside our still falsifying propositions since they give interruption as being a sort of mysterious and secondary withdrawal from a phenomenon, and also because they make this withdrawal or this detour into a phenomenon even though absent of the same order as presence, always already regulated and brought to order. Unworking is at work, but does not produce the work. Thus when we analyze and comment on the work, we have a tendency either to determine this movement of unworking as the originality of a new order, one harmony breaking with another, or to grasp it as the autonomous principle of the works engendering, its unity at work, whereas worklessness is always outside the work, that which has not let itself be put to work, the always ununified irregularity, the non-structure, that makes it so that the work relates to something other than itself, not because it says or enunciates, recites, reproduces, this other thing of the real but because it only says itself in saying this other thing, saying it through this distance and difference, this play between words and things that is also between things and things, between one language and another. This outside of difference makes it so that the real never seems to be in the real, but in the knowledge that elaborates and transforms it, thus always appearing more in the work's discourse than in life here but as soon as we have it, it is life, by way of the exteriority it represents and that it supposes to the work as its supposed model, that seems to embody the moment of unworking, and independently of what has come of it in the relation established by the work. The surreal of surrealism is thus perhaps offered to the future as this between two of difference, a field infinitely plural, a point of curvature where irregularity decides. The surreal is not a region, it is not situated, not in the real or above the real, above reason in unreason or beneath consciousness in the unconscious, nor is it the reconciliation always still to come of these irreconcilable possibilities. The surreal may well seek to constitute for itself imaginary objects, indicate itself in the margins, discover itself close to the unwanted through what is stunning and fascinating. These indications still have no more than a distancing value, reminders of the unseemly whose law is not only to disorder the order of the appropriate, but also to be unable to suit itself, concern itself, or conform to itself by assuming a form. The non-coinciding, the non-concerning of these are indeed what cause the surreal radically to change the meaning of what we have called the experience in which it is in play, not only separating it from all empiricism, but leading it to touch on everything at once, life, knowledge, thought, speech, love, time, society, and the whole itself, putting everything in question, ejecting the whole from the order of the whole, not by a stormy tumult or a purely capricious negation but through this concerted, non-concerted seeking that remains without assurance and without guarantee since it aims at the other that is always are there. Another field, without unity and without itinerary, which, although being there, is never given, remains to be opened and, once opened, opens on to Danger and the Marvel Houser before again closing itself, perhaps always already closed upon a new order, a tradition, a new culture, or, to limit ourselves to particular fates for now the asylum, and for Andrus Brett on that absence of the book dissimulated in a book of the narrative, in other words, that she herself who passed had wanted and, according to her desire, should not have carried the name of an author but instead a name for fire, for be careful, everything fades, everything vanishes and here the man's name itself also begins to be effaced, drifting alone, far from our understanding, indifferent to remembrance, foreign to admiration and refusing to be this glorious name on an appointed tomb.
already too unknown to let itself be born even by the anonymous force of surrealism, the trace of steps having never yet passed. Now, we must not take our distance from this book, a book always in the future, not only because it opened a new path for literature you know how, when the future's future is at stake, can one be content with such an innovation? A but because, perhaps, from now on committing to each of us the task of seizing the absence of work that designates itself as the work's center, it imparts to us the obligation to experience on the basis of what lack and in view of what default all writing bears what is written. This absence you already aimed at by the thinking, writing in which it becomes necessity, and presence, through chance you is such that it changes the possibility of every book, making of the work what always ought to put itself out of work, unworking itself as it modifies the relations between thought, discourse, and life. Life is other than what we write how does this other than manifest itself in there? Rather than in the way of this sentence, it is in lacuna, in silence, in the impossibility of saying where the provocation of danger is revealed. Misunderstanding another name for derangement is one of its signs. This enzymatic allusion as well, whatever desire or even illusion I may have had to the contrary, perhaps I was not up to what she was offering me. But what was she offering me? It doesn't matter. Here the work turns, one could even say turns short on condition that one here in this arrest what holds the work back before it accomplishes itself, also before it undoes itself. Then comes madness, Seven was told, several months ago, which is challenged via society's assumed right to take legal action against hero without its force of revelation being refused, and without the mental deterioration that it perhaps signifies being refused either. Then the final queer who goes here? Is it you, no? Is it only me? Is it myself? I so strange, so faltering, and responding is an echo to the first words of the book Who Am I? I so that the whole narrative is but the redoubling of the same action maintained in its spectral difference. Finally, the most surprising, as the book is coming to an end, it begins again only to destroy itself, obscuring the one who was na, she who is excluded from understanding, enigmatic passerby, by another figure who is celebrated as the only one living since loved, and thus free of enigma. A most troubling betrayal, an anxious attempt to make disappear from the life of time and from the life of life what always divides time and turns aside from living, what in effect excludes itself from every remembrance as from every possibility of ever having one time been lived. The encounter, that is the appearance disappearance, the space of greatest danger. It is through this appearance disappearance, and through the appeal of danger, that now signals the future of surrealism, no longer the title of a book, but tomorrow in play and as a player, the elitary that would always shatter the book, break up knowledge and derange even desire by making the book, knowledge, and desire when there is no time but between times a response to the unknown. Let us isolate by way of a single trait a few names, a few concepts escaping every conceptualization. Worklessness, the absence of, their, work. As Michel Foucault has reminded us in the strongest terms, the absence of work is used by the current ideology to designate as madness what it rejects. But the absence of work, confined in the asylum, is also always walled up in the work. If the work is elaborated on the basis of the work's absence, it will not rest until it has reduced this absence to insignificance, or, what is worse, rendered it proper to the understanding of a new order or the harmony of a new accord. The absence of the work nonetheless always cites the work outside itself, calling it always in vain to its own unworking and making the work recite itself, even when it believes it has its sights on the outside that it does not fail to include here rather than working to exclude it. The absence of work, the elitary that lies between reason and unreason, is not madness but madness plays the same role as the work since it permits society, as the work permits literature, to retain the absence of work of inoffensive, innocent, indifferent within the firm limits of a partitioned, cellular space. Disarrangement, disarray. Surrealism has always taken itself, and certainly with reason, to be a subversive movement, Andre Breton, surrealism could only die out if another more emancipatory movement were to be born a in other words, surrealism itself. But this would hardly suffice to allow us to grasp its truth, nor explain the fact that in having relation to everything it cannot content itself with this wholly the accomplishment of the whole, man as everything, that it nonetheless socially and politically demands through an energetic struggle at the most sensitive points, and through decisions always precise and firm. So realism is not a philosophical discourse, not a political action, a morality turned inside out, or an enterprise of literary renewal. No more than it has all of these at once, if it has a relation to everything as a whole, on the whole, it has no determinate object and not even this whole. The surrealist experiment, experience, aims, it seems to me, at the point of divergence on the basis of which all knowledge, as every limited affirmation of life, escapes itself in order to expose itself to the neutral force of derangement. The surrealist experience, experience, is the experience of experience, whether it seeks itself in a theoretical or practical form, an experience that deranges and deranges itself, 
disarranges as it unfolds and, in unfolding, interrupts itself. It is in this that surrealism or poetry itself is the experience of thought itself. And a kind of blindness would be needed to recognize in or in mad love works in which a certain didacticism intervenes to corrupt the poetic act or the pure beauty of the narrative. What misunderstanding! In works such as these thought is experience and as much as the written comes to thought in the movement of writing. Knowledge does not exist before writing, and writing, by its detours, its decisions, and its interruptions, knows itself always responsible for a latent knowledge, as it knows itself responding to another possibility, a possibility that is the other of all knowledge and whose attraction carries the act of writing, but carries it to the point of becoming risk. Danger, the danger by which, in the place of the work, is introduced the play of the absence of, their, work. The game, the elitary, the encounter. These words designate, without defining it, the new space, a space that is the vertigo of spacing, distance, dislocation, discourse, from out of which a beat in life through desire, in knowledge through the by no means uncontrolled expression of an absence of knowledge, be it in time through the affirmation of intermittency, or in the whole of the universe through the refusal of the unique and through the accord of a relation without unity, finally, in the work through the liberation of the absence of the work the UN known announces itself and, outside the game, conies into play. A space that is never more than the approach of another space, the neighboring of the distant, the beyond, but without either transcendence or immanence. A field at the confines of art and of life, a site of tension and difference where every relation is a relation of irreciprocity, a multiple space that could be affirmed, apart from every affirmation, solely by a plural speech, the speech that, giving a new meaning to plurality, would in turn receive from plurality the silent possibility, death finally lived. 18. The absence of the book. Let us try to question, that is to say, welcome in the form of a question what cannot reach the point of questioning. 1. Ah this insane game of writing with these words, simple as they are, Malam opens up writing to writing. But these simple words are such that it will take a great deal of time you a great variety of experiments, the work of the world, countless misunderstandings, works lost and scattered. The movement of knowledge, and, finally, the turning point of an infinite crisis of for us to begin to understand what decision is being prepared on the basis of this end of writing that is announced by its coming. 2. A. Apparently we read only because what is written is already there, laying itself out before our eyes. Apparently. But the first one to write, the one who cut into stone and wood under ancient skies, was hardly responding to the demands of a view requiring a reference point and giving it a meaning, rather, he was changing all relations between seeing and the visible. What he left behind was not something more, something added to other things, it was not even something less of a subtraction of matter, a hollow in relation to a relief. Then what was it? A gap in the universe, nothing that was visible, nothing invisible. I suppose the first reader was engulfed by this non-absent absence, but without knowing anything about it. And there was no second reader because reading, from now on understood as the vision of a presence immediately visible, that is to say intelligible, was affirmed precisely in order to make this disappearance into the absence of the book impossible. 3. A culture is bound to the book. The book as a repository and a receptacle of knowledge becomes identified with knowledge. The book is not only the book found in libraries, that labyrinth where all the combinations of forms, words, and letters are rolled up in volumes. The book is the book. Still to be read, to be writ ten, always already written and thoroughly penetrated by reading, the book constitutes the condition for every possibility of reading and writing. The book admits of three distinct investigations. There is the empirical book. The book acts as a vehicle of knowledge, a given, determinate book receives and gathers a given, determinate form of knowledge. But the book as book is never simply empirical. The book is the a priori of knowledge. We would know nothing if there did not always exist in advance the impersonal memory of the book and, more essentially, the prior disposition to write and to read contained in every book and affirming itself only in the book. The absolute of the book, then, is the isolation of a possibility that claims to have originated in no other anteriority. An absolute that will later tend to be affirmed with the Romantics, Novelis, then more rigorously with Hegel, then still more radically, though in a different way, with Malum as the totality of relations, absolute knowledge, or the work, in which would be accomplished either consciousness, which knows itself and comes back to itself after having exteriorized itself in all its dialectically linked figures, or language, closing upon its own affirmation and already dispersed. Let us recapitulate, the empirical book, the book, condition for all reading and all writing, and the book totality or work. But with increasing refinement and truth all these forms assume that the book contains knowledge as the presence of something that is virtually present and always immediately accessible, if only with the help of mediations and relays. Something is there that the book presents in presenting itself, and that reading animates and re-establishes through its animation in the life of a presence. Something that, on the lowest level, is the presence of a content or a signified, 
then, on a higher level, the presence of a form, of something that signifies or operates, and, on a still higher level, the development of a system of relations that is always already there, if only as a possibility to come. The book enfolds time, unfolds time, and holds this unfolding in itself as the continuity of a presence in which present, past, and future become actual. 4. A the absence of the book revokes all continuity of presence just as it eludes the questioning born by the book. It is not the book's anteriority, nor its continuously elided meaning. Rather it is outside the book, although enclosed within it are not so much its exterior as the reference to an outside that does not concern it. The more the work assumes meaning and acquires ambition, retaining in itself not only all works, but also all the forms and all the powers of discourse, the more the absence of the work seems about to propose itself, without, however, letting itself be designated. This occurs with Malum. With Malum, the work becomes aware of itself and thereby seizes itself as something that would coincide with the absence of the work, the latter then deflecting it from ever coinciding with itself and destining it to impossibility. A movement of detour whereby the work disappears into the absence of the work, but where the absence of the work increasingly escapes by reducing itself to being no more than the work that has always already disappeared. 5. A the act of writing is related to the absence of the work, but is invested in the work as book. The madness of writing of this insane game is the relation of writing, a relation established not between the writing and production of the book but, through the book's production, between the act of writing and the absence of the work. To write is to produce the absence of the work, worklessness, unworking, deso -ouvrement. Or again, writing is the absence of the work as it produces itself through the work, traversing it throughout. Writing as unworking, in the ascetive sense of the word, is the insane game, the indeterminacy that lies between reason and unreason. What happens to the book in this game in which worklessness is set loose in the operation of writing? The book, the passage of an infinite movement that goes from writing as an operation to writing as worklessness, a passage that immediately impedes. Writing passes by way of the book, but the book is not the to which it is destined, its destiny. Writing passes through the book, accomplishing itself there even as it disappears there, yet we do not write for the book. The book, a ruse by which writing goes toward the absence of the book. 6. A. Let us try to gain a clearer understanding of the relation of the book to the absence of the book. A. The book plays a dialectical role. In some sense it is there in order that not only the dialectics of discourse can be accomplished, but also discourse is a dialectic. The book is the work language performs on itself, as though there had to be the book in order for language to become conscious of itself, in order for language to grasp itself and complete itself in its incompletion. B. Yet the book that has become a worker even more, the whole literary progress, whether it affirm itself in a long succession of books or manifest itself in a single book or in the space that takes the place of that book or is at once more a book than other books and already outside the book, outside the category of book and outside its dialectic. More a book, a book of knowledge scarcely exists as a book, as a volume unfolding, the work, on the other hand, claims to be singular, unique, irreplaceable, it is almost a person. Hence the dangerous tendency for the work to promote itself into a masterpiece, and also to essentialize itself, that is to say designate itself by a signature, not merely signed by the author, but all Zoa and this is more grave here in some sense by itself. And yet it is already outside the book process, as though the work only marked the opening of the interruption through which the neutrality of writing passes and were oscillating, suspended between itself, the totality of language, and an affirmation that has not yet come about. Moreover, in the work, language is already changing direction or place, the place of its direction, no longer the logos that participates in a dialectics and knows itself, it is rather engaged in a relation that is other. So one can say that the work hesitates between the book, vehicle of knowledge and fleeting moment of language, and the book raised to the capital letter, idea and absolute of the book, and then between the worker's presence and the absence of the work that constantly escapes, and where time deranges itself as time. 7. At the end of the act of writing does not reside either in the book or in the work. Writing the work, we come under the attraction of the absence of the work. We necessarily fall short of the work, but we are not by this reason, by this failing, under the necessity of the absence of the work. 8. The book, a ruse by which the energy of writing which relies on discourse and allows itself to be carried along by the vast continuity of discourse in order, at the limit, to separate itself from it is also the ruse of discourse, restrained to cultured the mutation that threatens it and opens it to the absence of the book. Or again, a labor through which writing, modifying the givens of a culture, of experience and knowledge, that is to say, discourse, procures another product that will constitute an entirely new modality of discourse as a whole and will become integrated with it, even as it claims to disintegrate it. The absence of the book, reader, you would like to be its author, being then no more than the plural reader of the work. How long will it last to this lack that is sustained by the book, and that expels the book from itself as book? 
produce the book, then, so it will separate, disengage from itself in its dispersion. This will not mean you have produced the absence of the book. 9. At the book, the civilization of the book, affirms, there is a memory that transmits, there is a system of relations that orders, time ties its knot in the book where the void still belongs to a structure. But the absence of the book is not founded on a writing that leaves a mark and determines a directional movement whether this movement unfolds in linear fashion from an origin toward an end or unfolds from out of a center toward the surface of a sphere. The absence of the book makes appeal to a writing that does not commit itself, that does not set itself down, and that is not content with disavowing itself or with going back over its tracks to erase them. What is it that summons us to write when the time of the book, determined by a relation of beginning end, and the space of the book, determined by deployment from a center, cease to impose themselves? The attraction of, pure, exteriority. The time of the book, determined by the beginning end, past future, relation, on the basis of a presence. The space of the book, determined by deployment from a center, itself conceived as the search for an origin. Wherever there is a system of relations that orders or a memory that transmits, wherever writing gathers itself within the substance of a trace that reading regards in the light of a meaning, referring this trace back to an origin whose sign it is, and when emptiness itself belongs to a structure and allows for adjustment, there is the book, the law of the book. As we write, we always write from out of the exteriority of writing and against the exteriority of the law, and always the law draws upon what is written as a resource. The attraction of, pure, exteriority of the place where, since the outside precedes any interior, writing does not set itself down in the manner of a spiritual or an ideal presence, inscribing itself and then leaving a mark, a trace, or a sedimentary deposit that would allow one to track it down, that is, restore it to its ideal presence or ideality, its plenitude, its integrity of presence on the basis of that marker's lack. Writing marks but leaves no trace, it does not authorize us to work our way back from some vestige or sign to anything other than itself as, pure, extraority never given never constituting or gathering itself in a relation of unity with the presence, to be seen, to be heard, with the totality of presence or the unique, present absent. When we begin writing, we are either not beginning or we are not writing, writing does not go along with beginning. 10. A through the book, the disquiet of the energy of writing seeks to rest in and accrue to the work, ergon, but the absence of the work always from the outset calls upon it to respond to the detour of the outside where what is affirmed no longer finds its measure in a relation of unity. We have no idea of the absence of the work, not as a presence, certainly, but also not as the destruction of what would prevent it, even if only as an absence. To destroy the work, which itself is not, to destroy at least the affirmation and the dream of the work, to destroy the indestructible, to destroy nothing so the idea that destruction would swissy an idea that is out of place here will not impose itself. The negative can no longer be at work where the affirmation that affirms the work has taken place. And in no case can the negative lead to the absence of the work. To read would mean to read in the book the absence of the book, and, as a consequence, to produce this absence precisely where there is no question of the book being either absent or present, defined by an absence or a presence. The absence of the book is never contemporaneous with the book, not because this absence would announce itself from out of another time, but because from this absence comes the very non-contemporaneity from out of which it, too, comes. The absence of the book, always diverging, always without relation of presence with itself, and in such a way that it is never received in its fragmentary plurality by a single reader in the present of a Redinger unless, at the limit, with the present torn apart, dissuaded of the attraction of, pure, exteriority or the vertigo of space as distance, a fragmentation that sends us back to nothing more than the fragmentary. The absence of the book, the prior deterioration of the book, its dissident play with reference to the space in which it is inscribed, the preliminary dying of the book. To write, the relation to the other of every book, to what in the book would be description, a scriptury exigency outside discourse, outside language. To write at the edge of the book, outside the book. This writing outside language, a writing that would be in a kind of originary manner a language rendering impossible any object, either present or absent, of language. This writing would never be the writing of man, that is to say, never God's writing either, at most the writing of the other, of dying itself. 1 1. Ah, the book begins with the Bible in which the Logos is inscribed as law. Here the book attains its unsurpassable meaning, including what exceeds its bounds on all sides and cannot be gotten past. The Bible refers language to its origin, whether it be written or spoken, this language forms the basis for the theological era that opens and endures for as long as biblical space and time endure. The Bible not only offers us the preeminent model of the book, a forever unparalleled example, it also encompasses all books, no matter how alien they are to biblical revelation knowledge, poetry, prophesy, and proverbs, because it holds in it the spirit of the book. The books that follow the Bible are always contemporaneous with it. The Bible doubtless grows, 
increases on its own through an infinite growth that leaves it identical, it being forever sanctioned by the relation of unity, just as the ten laws set forth and contain the monologos, the one law, the law of unity that cannot be transgressed, and that negation alone cannot deny. The Bible, the testamentary book where the alliance, the covenant is declared, that is to say, the destiny of speech bound to the one who bestows language and where he consents to dwell through this gift that is the gift of his name, that is to say, also, the destiny of this relation of speech to language that is dialectics. It is not because the Bible is a sacred book that the books deriving from it the entire literary process are marked with the theological sign and cause us to belong to the theological realm. It is just the opposite, it is because the testament of the alliance or covenant of speech was enfolded in a book and took the form and structure of a book that the sacred, what is separate from writing, found its place in theology. The book is essentially theological. This is why the first manifestation of the theological, and also the only one that continues to unfold, could only have been in the form of a book. In some sense God only remains God, only becomes divine, inasmuch as he speaks through the book. Malam, faced with the Bible in which God is God, elevates the work in which the insane game of writing sets to work and already disavows itself, encountering indeterminacy's double game, necessity, chance. The work, the absolute of voice and of writing, unworks itself backslash say deso uva, even before it has been accomplished, before, in accomplishing itself, it ruins the possibility of accomplishment. The work still belongs to the book and therefore helps to maintain the biblical character of every work, yet it designates, in the neutral, the disjunction of a time and a space that are other, precisely that which no longer affirms itself in relation to unity. The worker's book leads Malam outside his name. The work in which the absence of the work holds sway leads he who is no longer called Malam to the point of madness. If we can, let us understand this to the point of as the limit that, once crossed, would be decisive madness, from which we would have to conclude that the limit of the edge of madness a conceived as the indecision that does not decide, or else as non-madness, is more essentially mad, this would be the abyss and not the abyss, but the edge of the abyss. Suicide, what is written as necessity in the book denounces itself as chance in the absence of the book. What the one says the other says over, and this reiterating speech, by virtue of its redoubling, contains death, the death of the self. 12. And the anonymity of the book is such that in order to sustain itself it calls for the dignity of a name. The name is that of a momentary particularity that supports reason, and that reason authorizes by raising it up to itself. The relation of book and name is always contained in the historical relationship that linked the absolute knowledge of system with the name Hegel, this relation between the book and Hegel, identifying the latter with the book and carrying him along in its development, made Hegel into a post-Hegel, a Hegel Marx, and then a Marx radically foreign to Hegel who continues to write, to bring into line, to know, and to affirm the absolute law of written discourse. Just as the book takes the name of Hegel, in its more essential, more uncertain, anonymity, the work takes the name of Malam, the difference being that Malam not only knows that the anonymity of the work is his, its, trait and the indicatine of his place, not only withdraws in this way of being anonymous, but also does not call himself the author of the work, at the very most he proposes himself, hyperbolically, as the power of the never unique or unifiable power to read the non-present work, in other words the power to respond, by his absence, to the always still absent work, the absent work not being the absence of the work, being even separated from it by a radical break. In this sense, there is already a decisive distance between Hegel's book and Malam's work, a difference evidenced by their different ways of being an mouse in the naming and signing of their work. Hegel does not die, even if he disavows himself in the displacement or turning about of the system, since every system still names him, Hegel is never altogether nameless. Malam and the work are without relation, and this lack of relationship is played out in the work, establishing the work as what would be forbidden to this particular Malam, as it would be to anyone else bearing a name, and as it would be to the work conceived as the power of accomplishing itself in and through itself. The work is freed from the name not because it could be produced without anyone producing it, but because its anonymity affirms it as being always and already outside whatever might name it. The book is the whole, whatever form this totality might take, and whether the structure of this totality is or is not wholly different from what belated reading assigns to Hegel. The work is not the whole, is already outside the whole, but in its resignation it still designates itself as absolute. The work is not bound up with success, with completion, as the book is, but with disaster, although disaster is yet another affirmation of the absolute. Let us say briefly that if the book can always be signed, it remains indifferent to whoever would do so, the work of festivity as disaster requires resignation, requires that whosoever claims to write it renounce himself as a self and cease designating himself. Then why do we sign our books? out of modesty, as a way of saying, these are still only books, indifferent to signatures. 13. At the absence of the book, 
which the written thing provokes as the future of writing a future that has never come to pass or does not constitute a concept, any more than does the word outside, the word fragment, or the word neutral, but it helps conceptualize the word book. It is not some contemporary interpreter who, in giving Hegel's philosophy its coherence, conceives of it as a book and thus conceives of the book as the finality of absolute knowledge, Malam does it already at the end of the 19th century. But, through the very force of his experience, Malam immediately pierces the book in order, dangerously, to designate the work whose center of attraction a center always off center would be writing. The act of writing, the insane game. But the act of writing has a relation, a relation of alterity, with the absence of the work, and it is precisely because Malam has a sense of this radical mutation that comes to writing through writing with the absence of the work that he is able to name the book, naming it as that which gives meaning to becoming by proposing a place and a time for it, the first and last concept. Only Malam does not yet name the absence of the book, or he recognizes it simply as a way of thinking the work, the work as failure or impossibility. 14. Ah, the absence of the book is not the book coming apart, even though in some sense coming apart lies at the origin of the book and is its counter-law. The fact that the book is always undoing itself, disarranging itself, still only leads to another book or to a possibility other than the book, not to the absence of the book. Let us grant that what haunts the book, what beleaguers it, would be the absence of the book that it always falls short of, contenting itself with containing it, keeping it at a distance, without being able to contain it, transform it into a content. Let us also grant the opposite, saying that the book encloses the absence of the book that excludes the book, but that the absence of the book is never conceived only on the basis of the book and solely as its negation. Let us grant that if the book carries meaning, the absence of the book is so foreign to meaning that non-meaning does not concern it either. It is very striking that within a certain tradition of the book, as it is brought to us through the Kabbalists' formulation, and even if it is a matter of sanctioning with this usage the mystical signification of literal presence, what is called the written Torah preceded the oral Torah, the latter then giving rise to an edited version that alone constitutes the book. Thought is here confronted with an enigmatic proposition. Nothing precedes writing. Yet the writing of the first tablets becomes legible only after they are broken, and because they are broken oh after and because of the resumption of the oral decision that leads to the second writing, the one with which we are familiar, rich in meaning, capable of issuing commandments, always equal to the law it transmits. Let us attempt to examine this surprising proposition by relating it to what might be an experience of writing yet to come. There are two kinds of writing, one white, the other black, one that renders invisible the invisibility of a colorless flame, the other that is made accessible in the form of letters, characters, and articulations by the power of the black fire. Between the two there is the oral, which, however, is not independent, it being always involved with the second kind of writing inasmuch as it is this black fear itself, the measured obscurity that limits and delimits all light and makes all light visible. Thus what we call oral is designation in a present of time and a presence of space, but also, first of all, the development or mediation that is ensured by a discourse that explains, receives, and determines the neutrality of the initial inarticulation. The oral Torah is therefore no less written than the written Torah, but is called oral in the sense that, as discourse, it alone allows there to be communication, that is, allows the word to be enunciated in the form of a commentary that at once teaches and declares, authorizes and justifies, as though language, discourse, were necessary for writing to give rise to general legibility, and perhaps also to the law understood as prohibition and limit, as though, as well, the first writing, in its configuration of invisibility, had to be considered as being outside speech, and as turned only toward the outside, an absence or fracture so originary it will have to be broken to escape the savagery of what Holdelin calls the anorgic. 15. A writing is absent from the book, writing being the non-absent absence from out of which the book, having absented itself from this absence, at both its levels, the oral and the written, the law and its exegesis, the interdiction and the thought of the interdiction, makes itself legible and comments upon itself by enclosing history, the closure of the book, the severity of the letter, the authority of knowledge. What we can say of this writing that is absent from the book, and nonetheless stands in a relationship of alterity with it, is that writing remains foreign to legibility, illegible, then, inasmuch as to read is necessarily to enter through one's gaze into a relation of meaning or non-meaning with a presence. There would therefore be a writing exterior to the knowledge that is gained through reading, and also exterior to the form or the requirements of the law. Writing, pure, exteriority, foreign to every relation of presence, as to all legality. As soon as the exteriority of writing slackens, that is, as soon as, in response to the appeal of the oral force, it accepts taking form in language by giving rise to the book written discourse this exteriority tends to appear, at the highest level as the exteriority of the law, and, at the lowest as the interiority of meaning. 
the law is writing itself, writing that has renounced the exteriority of interdiction, I and Adiah, in order to designate the place of the interdict. The illegitimacy of writing, always refractory in relation to the law, hides the asymmetrical illegitimacy of the law in relation to writing. Writing, exteriority. Perhaps there is a pure exteriority of writing, but this is only a postulate already unfaithful to the neutrality of writing. In the book that signs our alliance with every book, exteriority does not succeed in authorizing itself, and, in inscribing itself, inscribes itself in the space of the law. The exteriority of writing, laying itself out and stratifying itself in the form of the book, becomes exteriority as law. The book speaks as law. Reading it, we read in it that everything that is, is either forbidden or allowed. But isn't this structure of authorization and interdiction a result of our level of reading? Might there not be another reading of the book in which the book's other would cease to proclaim itself in precepts? And if we were to read this way, would we still be reading a book? Would we not be ready then to read the absence of the book? The initial exteriority, perhaps we should assume that its nature is such that we would be unable to bear it except under the sanction of the law. What would happen if the system of prohibition and limitations ceased to protect it? Or might it simply be the, at the limit of possibility, precisely to make the limit possible? Is this exteriority no more than an exigency of the limit? Is the limit itself conceived only through a delimitation that is necessary at the approach of the UN limited, a delimitation that would disappear if it were ever passed ever for this reason impassable, yet always passed over precisely because it is impassable? 16. A writing contains exteriority. The exteriority that becomes law falls henceforth under the law's protection, the law, in turn, is written, that is to say, once again falls under the custody of writing. We must assume that this redoubling of writing, a redoubling that from the outset designates it as difference, does nothing more than affirm in this duplicity the trait of exteriority itself, which is always becoming, always exterior to itself and in a relation of discontinuity. There is a first writing, but inasmuch as it is first, it is already distinct from itself, separated by that which marks it. Being at the same time nothing but this mark and yet also other than it if it thereby marks itself, so broken, distanced, denounced in this disjunctive outside where it announces itself that a new rupture will be necessary a bridge that is violent but human, and in this sense, definite and delimited, so that, having become a text that shatters, and the initial fragmentation having given way to a determined act of rupture, the law, under the veil of interdiction, can offer a promise of unity. In other words, the breaking of the first tablets is not a break with a first state of unitary harmony, on the contrary, what the break inaugurates is the substitution of a limited exteriority, where the possibility of a limit announces itself, for an exteriority without limitation of the substitution of a lack for an absence, a break for a gap, an infraction for the pure impure fraction of the fragmentary, that which, on the hither side of the sacred separation, presses in the scission of the neutral, the scission that is the neutral. To put it yet another way, it is necessary to break with the first exteriority so that with the second, where the logos is law and the law logos, language, henceforth regularly divided, in a reciprocal bond of mastery with itself and grammatically constructed, might engage us in the relations of mediation and immediation that guarantee discourse, and then with the dialectic, where the law in its turn will dissolve. The first writing, far from being more immediate than the second, is foreign to all these categories. It does not give graciously through some ecstatic participation in which the law protecting the one would merge with it and ensure confusion with it. The first writing is alterity itself, a severity and an austerity that never authorizes, the burning of a parching breath infinitely more rigorous than any law. The law is what saves us from writing by causing writing to be mediated through the rupture of the transitiveness of speech. A salvation that introduces us to knowledge and, through our desire for knowledge, to the book where knowledge maintains desire in dissimulating it from itself. 17. The proper nature of the law, it is infringed upon even when it has not yet been stated. Of course, it is henceforth promulgated from on high, at a distance and in the name of the distant, but without there being any relation of direct knowledge with those for whom it is destined. We might conclude from this that the law was transmitted and as bearing transmission, thus becoming the law of transmission who establishes itself as law only through the decision to fall short of itself in some fashion, there would be no limit if the limit were not passed, revealed as impassable by being passed. Yet does not the law precede all knowledge? including knowledge of the law, which it alone inaugurates in paving the way for its conditions by a prior one must, if only on the basis of the book in which the law attests to itself through the order of the structure that it looms over as it establishes it. Always anterior to the law, neither founded in nor determined by the necessity of being brought to knowledge, never imperiled by anyone's misunderstanding, always essentially affirmed by the infraction that supposes reference to it, drawing into its trial the authority that removes itself from it, and all the more firm for being open to facile transgression, the law. The laws one must is first of all not a thou shalt. One must applies to no one or, more determinedly, applies only to no one. 
the non-applicability of the law is not merely a sign of its abstract force, of its inexhaustible authority, of the reserve it maintains. Incapable of saying thou, the law never aims at anyone in particular, not because it would be universal, but because it separates in the name of unity, being the very separation that enjoins with a view to the unique. Such is perhaps the law's august falsehood, having legalized the outside in order to make it possible, or real, the law frees itself of every determination and every content in order to preserve itself as pure in applicable form, a pure exigency to which no presence can correspond, even though it is immediately particularized in multiple norms and through the code of alliance in ritual forms so as to permit the discrete anteriority of a return to self, where the infrainable intimacy of the thou shalt will be affirmed. 18. Other ten commandments, Lois, are law only in reference to unity. Go to the name that cannot be taken in vain because no language can contain it are is God only in order to uphold unity and in this way designate its sovereign finality. No one can assail the one. And thus the other bears witness, testifies to nothing other than the unique, a reference that unites all thought with what is not thought, keeping it turned toward the one as toward that upon which thought cannot infringe. It is therefore of consequence to say, not the one God but unity, strictly speaking, is God, transcendence itself. The exteriority of the law finds its measure in responsibility with regard to the one, an alliance of the one and the many that thrusts aside as impious the primal diality of difference. The nonetheless remains in the law itself a clause that retains a memory of the exteriority of writing, when it is said, Thou shalt make no images, thou shalt not represent, thou shalt reject presence in the form of resemblance, sign, and mark. What does this mean? First, and almost too clearly, interdiction of the sign as a mode of presence. Writing, if to write is to refer back to the image and to invoke the idol, is inscribed outside the exteriority that is proper to it, an exteriority writing then rejects by attempting to fill it with the emptiness of words and with the pure signification of the sign. Thou shalt make no idol is thus, in the form of law, not a statement about the law, but about the exigency of writing that precedes every law. 19. A. Let us grant that the law is obsessed with exteriority, by that which beleaguers it and from which it separates via the very separation that institutes it as form, in the very movement by which it formulates this exteriority is law. Let us grant that exteriority is writing, a relation forever without relation, can be called an exteriority that slackens into law precisely at the moment when it is most taught, when it has the tension of a gathering form. It is necessary to know that as soon as the law takes place, has found its place, everything changes, and it is the so-called initial exteriority that, in the name of the law henceforth impossible to denounce, gives itself a slackness itself, an undemanding neutrality, just as the writing outside the law, outside the book, seems now to be nothing more than the return to a spontaneity without rules, an ignorant automatism, an irresponsible movement, an immoral game. To put this differently, one cannot go back from exteriority as law to exteriority as writing, in this context, to go back would be to go down. That is to say, one cannot go back up save by accepting the fall, and being incapable of consenting to it, an essentially indeterminate fall into insensual chance. What the law disdainfully calls a game here the game in which everything is each time risked and everything lost, the necessity of the law, the chance of writing. The law is the summit, there is no other. Writing remains outside the arbitration between high and low. One I would like to state that this book, in its articulated and articulated, mobile relation of that of its plier brings together texts for the most part written from 1953 to 1965. This indication of dates, referring to a long period of time explains why I take them to be already posthumous, that is to say, regard them as being nearly anonymous. Thus belonging to everyone and even written, always written, not by a single person, but by several, all those to whom falls the task of maintaining and prolonging the exigency to which I believe these texts, and with an obstinacy that today astonishes me, ceaselessly seek to respond, even unto the absence of the book they designate in vain.